Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Today, we have got episode number 41 for you all. And as you can see, we've got a special guest on the podcast today. Yes, Shout out Andrew Velez, one of the hosts from the Pick a Side podcast, also hosting the Fantasy Reaction Show. Um, we appreciate you for coming on the, the podcast today, man. We got a lot, a lot to talk about. In season tournament knockout, knockout brackets have been set. Um, we're gonna go through all of that, give our picks and predictions. A lot of playoff type basketball being played last night. I'm um, gonna be rolling through some of the intriguing matchups in week 13 of the NFL season, and then gonna wrap it up with a little little head-to-head defensive player of the year draft, making some start of five, starting fives out of the best defenders of all time, of all time. But quickly going to get the housekeeping out of the way, as always. If you are on audio platforms, be sure to leave a five-star rating, pre-download the show, helps us out a ton. If you're watching on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe. I know a lot of y'all are fans of the Pick a Side show, but if y'all haven't heard about them, go ahead, check them out, bro. They've been killing it. They just hit 50,000 subs, so congratulations right. on that. Um, Thank you. You're going to kick... For sure, bro. We can kick it off like we normally do. How are we doing today, Andrew? How are we feeling? How's how's life been? How's everything been treating you, bro? Life's been good. Sports have been great. It's been a long time since I've been able to watch Bronco football and just just reap nothing but greatness. Five game heater, one of the hottest teams in football. I've been doing great. But gentlemen, I appreciate you guys having me. It, it's it's gonna be fun to to chop up some ball with y'all. For sure, for sure. Um uh, Kick it over to you, Dame. How you doing today, bro? How you feeling? It's a, we haven't done a two pods in the same week in a little minute. I know, right? We need to pick it up a little bit. This is fun. Yeah. But, you know, I'm, I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. My Lakers just destroyed the, the Pistons like they should. So, talk to them. Talk you, to know, them. you know what I'm saying? They handled business like we were supposed to. But other than that, I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. I'm ready. I'm excited for this one. Very excited. Yeah, we definitely definitely going to get into the Lakers. And I'm going to just – I'm going to hit the back seat and let y'all, let y'all figure <laughs> that out. <laughs> Um, but like I said, we're going to go ahead and get right into it. The knockout round of the in-season tournament was finalized last night with the end of the group play. Um, now I think it's eight teams, right? Um, yep. sitting in the in-season tournament bracket. Um, and I'll be honest, there are like, these are all teams that are squarely in, these are playoff teams, um, and I think when we kind of did the initial reaction to when the in-season tournament was announced, kind of thought we'd get more younger teams, teams that may not be in typical playoff contention um, for this, this uh, knockout round. But uh, either way, these teams showed up on that uh, on Tuesday night, that last set of group play games and got the job done. Some big, big games. Um, Heat Bucks was playoff basketball atmosphere. Definitely. Kings Warriors was playoff basketball atmosphere. You had the Celtics hack a Drummond. I know they were already up 30 <laughs> to make sure that they run up the score for the point differential. There was a lot going on. It was fast paced. Um, but overall, I just wanted to get both of y'all's re- reactions on now that like, the group play stage is done, kind of how you feel about this first season of the in season tournament. Is this something that you've enjoyed? Is it something that you feel like? the league can expand on like what are your initial impressions yeah we've been watching some some great basketball all around just look at last night that kings warriors game that i know we're going to talk about a little bit later i mean every single game it seems it's just coming right down to the very end let me not say every single one because that bulls that bulls celtics game got pretty ugly pretty fast but you look at the bracket. There are some fun teams there. I don't know if we were anticipating that the Pelicans would be one of those teams that we're talking about, although we know they got some talent. But, hey, being a top three team in their – in the in the, I guess the conference for the Western Conference, that's one issue that I have with it. Probably the only one that I wish that they would have made it a little bit of Eastern Conference, Western Conference, put them in a, in a bracket together. Or let me not say a bracket, in a group together. And just to, to combine it a little bit where it's not just East versus West. Uh, or also one of my guys on the podcast, John, shout out to John. He said that they should have made it where it was just divisions so we can make divisions matter again. I thought that that was a, a clean idea. idea. But some matchups that we got that are that are going to be awesome to watch. We've seen the Lakers and the Suns a couple times so far this season. Get to watch them a third time early on. When, when you're watching LeBron James versus Kevin Durant, that's something that you can't take for granted. It's been a while since we watched it. We got spoiled so far this year. 
we get round three. Kings versus Pelicans going to be a sneaky good game. Uh, I think the Pelicans might be in that game a little bit more than what people want to anticipate. But Milwaukee, where I feel like they've been having some disrespect put on their names, where they're not this good defensive team, but they've only lost five games. That's interesting to me going up against the Knicks. Solid matchup for sure. And then the Pacers, who have been one of the surprise teams of the year. And I say surprise because I don't think anybody anticipated that they would be the number one rated offense in basketball. I had them as a playoff team coming in, but number one offense in basketball, no way I could have predicted that was just having this conversation. It's reminiscent of last year's Sacramento Kings last year that they were the surprise team. They go and they finish pretty high in the Western conference, but they were built on offense and they're not a good defense. Look at this Pacers team. Number one offense, bottom three defense. Some's got to be figured out there, but it's been fun to watch them play some some really good offense. I love what I've been seeing from the in-season tournament. I think that it was a great job by Adam Silver and company. I'm looking forward to it, to, to see how it evolves. But year one, it's been awesome, especially because Lakers have been pretty damn good in it too. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. But not yet. <clears throat> pretty much the same exact thing. I like the fact that, you know, you see the players are actually playing for something a little bit. You know what I mean? Because in the beginning, you didn't know if, like, players was going to take it seriously because they're like, ah, this back. in-season tournament, you know, it's not the playoffs. It's not something that's really that important. But, it, game, like you said, games have come down to the wire. People will care about the point differential. It's like, you know, it's been some really good games, and the players are actually, like, playing like it means something. So, that, I mean, that's all you could really ask for because the whole point was to get eyes on, you know, the NBA regular season. Because, obviously, the big diehard, like, NBA fans, you're going to watch regular season games. But, you know, yeah. sometimes players sit out. You know, pay, players don't take, you know, the well, middle of, what, November, those type of games mm -hmm. too, too serious. So, now you got got guys really playing for something. And it's been really good. So, I'm excited to see which teams really, like, kick it up a notch. Like, are we going to see, like, legit, like, this like this is the playoff type of, you know, atmosphere? Or, you know, are guys going to kind of coast a little bit? So, I'm excited to see how it goes out because, you know, we got some good, some really good matchups. Because you already hit it on the head. Like, we, we winning it. We winning the whole thing. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you listen, Billy, you messed up, bro. You put two Lakers fans on the pod. Bro, you can't do that. You can't do that. One's bad exactly. enough. One's bad exactly. enough. You get two. You get two. Ooh. Uh, like I said, I, we have a dedicated segment just for the Lakers. And right then, I'm going to, I'm it. not even. I'm going to introduce it, and I'm not going to say a word let y'all get to it. Um, but, no, I, I agree. I think – I don't know, like, for this first iteration, if this could have gone any better, really. Like, it feels like everything that the NBA set out for this to be, it is checking all of those boxes. Like, it's bringing us higher-intensity basketball at a time where this is typically the dead of the NBA season, like the hype around opening day, like – the start of the season had, would have, you know, subsided. And you usually kind of had a, a big lull until you get to those Christmas day games. And this is really bridging that gap almost perfectly. Like by the time this ends, we'll be only a week or so out um, from those Christmas day games. Yep. Um, and so it, it feels like it's, it's really seamlessly fit into, you know, that, that time frame for the league. Um, and I, at first, you know, everybody has their opinions about the city edition jerseys and the courts as well. Like some of them, really all of them, both of them are hit or miss, but I do appreciate that they went out of their way to kind of go above and beyond and really make it look different than just a run of the mill November regular season NBA game. Like all of that, I think added to the atmosphere. Um, and then, like you said, the games that we got last night, it was clear that in every single one of them, a, all the teams and coaches understood what was at stake to make, to give themselves the best opportunity to advance to the knockout round. Um, and for the, the instances where you have like teams in a, almost a winner go home scenario, they're treating it as such. And it feels like playoff basketball, the crowds are into it. The Miami crowd was into it the entire game against Milwaukee. Um, obviously, and I don't know if y'all know this, uh, Golden State and Sacramento have played 11 times this year, like in counting last year's regular season, the postseason, oh, and oh. just 2023. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> just this calendar year. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> um, and if you count, if you count preseason two, it's 13. Like they have played each other a lot in the year of 2023. Um, and so obviously there, there's history there with the playoff series, obviously going to game seven. So you knew the crowd was going to be into it, um, but the players really embody that. 
Um, what I thought was really cool is they had Steph mic'd up and he was like, look, you know, we're, we got to get out to a big lead. He understands they had to win that game by 12 or more if they wanted a chance to advance to the knockout round. Um, he's mic'd up talking about, look, you know, even if we're up, we can't ever let up the gas on a young team like this because they understand what's at stake too. And like, they just, they would have to either lose by 11 or less or, or win the game. And ultimately um, the Kings erase what was a 24 point deficit it was definitely a choke job. Um, and, and we're able to win that game. And with that, we might as well really just like, let's dive into that game as a whole. Cause I think again, it highlights so many of the flaws with this golden state roster. Um, if you've been listening to the pod for a while, we've talked about golden state multiple times before the season, during the season, like they had so many needs coming out of last season's loss in the playoffs to the Lakers that, you know, obviously after the Draymond and Jordan Poole situation, you've got Bob Myers leaving, Mike Dunleavy comes in. It's, it's a tough situation. Like you can't deny that, but there were needs that had to be met. And I think I'm pretty fair in saying, I don't think any of them were met. Like they didn't really address any of their issues on perimeter defense. They got smaller somehow when they were already mm -hmm. one of the smaller mm -hmm. teams in the league, knowing that the reigning NBA champion is a team that's engined by a seven foot Serbian machine. Like you cannot, <laughs> there's no way you can think going small there would be the best option. Um, and now they're like in a position where you've got Clay's contract coming up, Wiggins contract coming up. There's a lot of question marks here and there are rumblings starting to go around with what's the best way to proceed because in years past, you know, they talked about that double timeline. I think that that's kind of thrown in the trash at this point, rightfully so, because your best chance of winning a championship is obviously maximizing Steph Curry's window. So to do that, they have some hard decisions that they need to make. Um, and for them to be sitting at eight and 10 right now um, and on top of, I think Gary Payton tore his calf last night too, which is yeah, tough to see. Yeah. So hopefully he gets healthy soon. But um, between that injury, Chris Paul, I think he said he has a nerve injury in his leg. I don't know how serious that is. Um, he's honestly, he's kind of outplayed my expectations for him this season. Um, like on top of all of that, Wiggins has had a rough start to the year. Clay has had a rough start to the year. Both of them have had little spurts here and there recently, but even still, like looking at their full counting stats, like Curry is doubling the next closest score in points per game average. That sad. is not sustainable. It's, it's not sustainable for a full season. Um, so I don't know. What did y'all think about this game in particular and really like where the Warriors sit and what – what can they do to to change to make anything better for this small window that they have left with Steph Curry? Damn, you want to go first? I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, honestly, the main thing is uh, they're so Steph dependent, bro. It's crazy. Like, mm -hmm. I believe in this game, I think the leading scorer obviously was Steph. The leading rebounder, surprisingly, was Steph. The leading person, leading assist man was Steph. Like, there's just they're so Steph dependent, and like you said, like it's. They got they got smaller and they got older. They got slower. None of that is what they needed. Like coming into this season, and I we talked about it. Like I didn't think it really what really was going to work. Um, and we kind of seen it. Like they got a slow start to the season. They're relying on a couple of their guys like Clay, like Wiggins, who aren't playing well. So that puts more pressure on Steph. So right now, to me, they're just a Steph dependent team. Um, they're not even like that great of a three point shooting team. It's really kind of just like I said, everything is really Steph reliant. So, and we're kind of seeing it, you know what I mean? Like, they don't really look like that great of a team. And then even when we talked about it, like, Chris Paul coming in, he's played better, like I said. He's played he's played better than I thought, but now, look, he's hurt. Like, you know, that's the thing with Chris Paul. Like, you never can rely on him because he's always going to be hurt. So, that's my biggest thing. I, I just feel like they're super Steph dependent right now. <sighs> to me, also, it's you mentioned how – they didn't address their needs. They tried. Dario Saric, I guess, tried. Barely. Dario Saric was supposed to be your, your big man answer. Like I know Kevon Looney 
has been able to do a job for the Golden State Warriors. But off the bench, it can't just be Dario Saric is your answer at big. I know that the Golden State Warriors have really embraced that whole small ball idea. But the small ball idea only works when your guys are knocking down shots. Klay right. Thompson has been completely underwhelming. Andrew Wiggins, who had himself a great ball game last night, got to give credit where it's due. Finally, you you have been... Since the Golden State Warriors were coming off their championship run, you were supposed to be the number two guy. We saw it last year prior to his off-the-court situation where he had to miss an extended period of time before coming back before the playoffs where he was knocking down the three ball at a career-high clip. He really was playing some high-level basketball, playing with some confidence. Haven't really seen that for a majority of the season so far with Wiggins. Great to see him come back a little bit last night. But then down the stretch of the game, you have Moses Moody who's cooking. I feel like through all of this, we haven't addressed Steve Kerr, who really has become a questionable head coach. You're not making the right decisions when the situations arise. Moses Moody is killing down the stretch. You take him out of the game just to run your typical five-man rotation. To me, that becomes irresponsible on the head coach. You see someone's doing a, a great job off the bench, that they're killing it. Ride the hot hand. It can't be that difficult just because they're a young guy. It can't always be that they are that they have to earn their stripes. Moses Moody, in that moment, earned his minutes, earned his stripes. Give him the opportunity to at least close that game. So for the Golden State Warriors also to throw that game away, where they were up almost 30 points at one point in time in that second quarter, down the stretch of the game where they had multiple opportunities to ice it. You have Draymond throwing the ball away and Steph Curry throwing the game away as well. So it's it, it's not just on just individual pieces. Even in a game where Dre and Curry have been, for a majority of the season, your best players, Curry by far and away has been their best player. Dre limiting turnovers, obviously doing the job that he does, not just defensively, but as the playmaker in the offense. In that game, we saw them also come up short, not just Draymond, but also Curry at the very end too. So it's right now it's a team thing. It's not just pointing at the individual one guy that, that can ultimately bring it back together. It's that multiple pieces need to come together and realize we need to be playing higher level basketball. And I'll give the Warriors the benefit of the doubt because they have so much continuity on their side. And Klay Thompson has shown us a history of being able to get it together. He's going through a bad low right now, one of the worst of his career. So I don't want to be one of those guys that's going to shit on Klay Thompson just because of a couple stretch of games where he hasn't been shooting the ball well. Something needs to click, and whether it's Steve Kerr, whether it's it's Curry being the leader in the locker room, coming to coming to the locker room and saying, "Hey guys, we need it. We need to change something. I don't know what it is, but we need to be doing something different because clearly something's not working. You can't lose that game last night against the Kings. You had bigger. You had a bigger picture on your mind, talking about we need to win by X amount of points. You needed to win, period, because I know that you want to make the into the to the knockout round, but you also need that win on the win column regardless because you've been playing some struggling basketball. So the Warriors are one of those teams that before the season started, I wasn't the highest on just because, like you mentioned, they really didn't address their needs overly by any means, and then they're an old team on top of it. So it's tough sledding for the Golden State Warriors right now. I'm so glad you brought up Steve Kerr. <laughs> we talked about this a couple of episodes ago. And I don't, we've touched on it a couple of times. I feel like so he makes mistakes, and so many of them, so much of it gets swept under the rug because of Definitely. his resume. He's a, Definitely. he's a coach of the dynasty. Mm -hmm. He's got four rings. All of that is well and good, but the NBA and sports in general, a lot of times, is a "What have you done for me lately?" type of situation. Talk. And like we're looking at right now, what you said, I have it here in my notes, like. Moody went four for four in the fourth quarter and got pulled. How? How does that even make sense? Like you said, for their typical lineup, which includes Clay, Clay made one field goal in the second half. You can't, at some point, I understand from a culture perspective, from just like at that point, y'all are like, y'all have a close relationship as like friends. Like y'all have been in the same organization for over a decade. I get it, but like your job as a coach is to win games. And if Clay, this version of Clay, what he provides right now is shooting. If the shot is not falling, he's not the defender he used to be. He doesn't have any type of the 
off the dribble game that he used to have, you know, somewhat decently pre prior to the injuries. Um, he could drive to the rim. He was able to, you know, work out of the post a little bit. Like he had a little bit more to his offensive bag than just coming off of pin downs or catch and shoots. Mm -hmm. But if those aren't falling right now, none of that is there. He's just a negative player on the court. And like you said, I, I don't want to say it like I'm bashing him, but that's just a mm -hmm. reality of where he is right now. Like you said, he's gone through shooting slumps and that's a reality of that play style. There's mm -hmm. some nights the shots aren't going to fall. Um, but if you're not providing more to the court, not bringing more to the team, there are guys on that bench that can like, and they need to be playing in moments like this. Cause that's the difference. But then this is a one point loss. They were up by 24. It's literally a one possession game. One more bucket from anywhere could have like flipped this script entirely. Um, so I, I'm glad that you, you brought up Steve Kerr because I, We've talked about it a couple of times. He just – he feels like he gets too much leeway, like, from fans in general. Um, He's a Steph Curry leeway. merchant, and that's okay. Steph Curry is <laughs> one of the greatest ever. It, there's nothing wrong with that, but he's a Steph Curry merchant. They go as far as Steph Curry takes him. And in last night's game, one thing no one talks about also, that buzzer's coming, Steph Curry, that shot's not going in. That's not me hating. It's just the truth. Unfortunately, well, in those moments – we haven't seen him be clutch. He's in those been situations. clutch. He's been clutch this year, though. He's has, he has. I he has his shooting splits this year in the clutch arm. No, these, no, but these the guys. splits in general, they're just dumb. That's why yeah. I, I, I'm no jo all joking aside. The splits from Steph. Let me see if I pull him up real quick. Forty eight percent from the field. 44% from three, of course, nine, about 95% from the free throw. That's just what Steph Curry is going to do for you. Maybe the field goal percentage is a little bit lower than expected because that's just how efficient that he is as a scorer but in those situations where last night was one of those odd nights where monk making that shot was incredible <laughs> i don't want to say bs because that's kind of knocking malik who had himself a great yeah. game that is a bs shot it, it was gonna be it was gonna be a mickey mouse shot no <laughs> doubt about it but monk was having himself a good game i don't want to slight him but Make the right play. I understand you want that moment. You, you've been looking for it for a while now. Make the right play. Kurt, Clay, who has been cold, maybe that's one of those confidence boosters where we've seen Clay earlier in the season against the Kings go out and ice them, hit a game-winning shot. Unfortunately, Clay was open. You mentioned it. Only one, one bucket in the second half. Could have that been the moment that got him like, hey, your teammates trusting you. Curry taking a half-court shot. You live with Curry taking the shot because he is Steph Curry, but a half-court shot as opposed to when two guys are on you, as opposed to hitting Clay wide open there. I know times are winding down. You're not really thinking too much and trying to view the, the court like you should or normally how you would. But I, it, it's really it's really unfortunate, I should say, that Steph just hasn't been able to overcome in those situations. Yeah. Do you guys, One more do you thing. guys have – Go ahead, go ahead. You, you, nah, go Dan. I was going to say, do you guys have any, because like it sounds like we all kind of coming into the season was a little skeptical on the Warriors in general, but like especially mm -hmm. now, like seeing it a little bit, do you guys have like any faith at all that they'll get it turned around or even just in the future moving forward? Because like it seemed like they kind of, even how you talked about like, you know, Clay hasn't made a shot um, or made one shot in the second half, but they still go down to him in the stretch. It's like, it seems like they always hone in on the fact that, oh no, this was the core this was the dynasty. Like, we're always going to heart back into that, like, those moments. Um, so, like, do you guys have faith in them, like, moving forward at all? Or, like, what are your thoughts on that? I genuinely feel like, like, let's say Clay's out of his shooting slump. He's playing basketball. We know he can. Same thing with Wiggins. At best, this feels like the same team from last year, where it's like mm -hmm. last year – they didn't feel like a team that really could contend in the West, let alone contend for the NBA championship. So it's like, yeah, they're better. Like, cause right now they don't look like they might, like, they might genuinely miss the playoffs. Like that's not an unfair thing to say. But mm -hmm. It's like, let's say these guys get out of their slump. They play Warriors basketball. We expect from them. There's still those same holes that we just talked about that they're not filled. Like I, I can't see a world where let's say Clay and Wiggins are shooting good. You put them into a seven-game series against the Nuggets. Are you taking them or the Nuggets? You're taking the Nuggets. Absolutely. Do any of the Suns, the Lakers, the Timberwolves maybe? Like any of these big dog teams in the West, like I'm taking all of them over the Warriors, even if they're playing and making more shots. 
So like, I honestly, as crazy as it could sound too, you could maybe even throw in an OKC there. I say that with the idea oh, of sure, if good. the Warriors are going up against a team that has a dominant big presence, you mentioned the Nuggets, you mentioned the Lakers. Suns are one of those that maybe they match up relatively well, but Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, these are two guys that are going to score right. regardless. Of guard who's them. who's guarding them. any of them? No, on they, the perimeter? they can't you guard them. It's a mismatch somewhere. Nobody can go. You, there's no. There's no. You can try and limit, but there's no stopping KD. There's no stopping Booker. You can respect Wiggs. Maybe you can respect Gary Payne, but right now I say maybe because the the calf injury. He's a right. solid defender, mm-hmm. no doubt about it. But that's just not a great matchup for the Golden State Warriors, the Timberwolves, Rudy Gobert. He's obviously one of the better paint presence at least this season coming back from a, a pretty down year last year the Timberwolves have just been clicking on all cylinders and then look at what's going on over there in OKC with Chet Holmgren who it seemed as if it was signed and sealed your rookie of the year is Victor Wembanyama. Chet Holmgren I felt mm-hmm. very confident in that that he was going to make it a strong conversation because all OKC all, all excuse me all OKC needed was a big presence. That's what they missed last year. And now you add Chet, who's one of the better shot blockers. He's also a unicorn with the way that he can score the basketball. It's not a great matchup for Golden State Warriors where you're seeing OKC play some high-level defense. You're seeing OKC be one of the better offenses. Shea is a a first-team All-NBA player, a top-10 player in the association. A lot of noise was being made on that prior to the season started, but let's not underrate. Shea Gillis Alexander. No, Warriors, I don't want to say that they won't make the playoffs slash play in because I respect Steph Curry too much. I think he's simply too good to allow his team to miss at least the play in. But at the same time, this isn't a contender. And that's the big picture when you're talking about Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, and Draymond Green. This isn't a team that's contending for the, the, the Larry. No way. Yeah, it's. I genuinely would not trade anything to be Mike Dunleavy right now. I, I know <laughs> the rumblings inside, like even just the rumors that start to come out, you've seen them try to get linked to guys like Zach Levine. And mm-hmm. it's like you start throwing stuff in the trade machine. You realize it's, it's, it's a contract that would have to go in there like a, yep. like a Clay Thompson. Clay Can Thompson you, could, for sure. Could you, you rip move? that? Could you rip that off? Right. Like, do you want to be the guy that splits up that dynasty? Like, and Steph's gonna have to okay that. Is Steph right. gonna okay that? That's another one too. Is Steph gonna right. say, yeah, you? I'm I'm okay with moving on from Clay. To to be honest, I don't know if he is. That's why I feel like they're going down with the ship because it's like, is that the right move? It might be, but it's like, can you actually make that move? And it's like you said, is Steph gonna okay that move? That's a whole different ball game right there. So I don't know what the future looks like for him. I, I can't see, like, I feel like it would be so weird to see a, a, any of the three in a different basketball jersey at this point. For sure. Like, yeah. The Draymond stuff, like, prior to him signing his extension, where, like, he kind of did the hinting, like, oh, yeah, it'd be cool for him to play for, t- like, his hometown team in Detroit. It's like, even no, still. Like, I wasn't saying no. That's all I was saying. <laughs> I was definitely yeah. not saying no. Him and AD would have been insane. The in defense the would have been all world. It would have been all <laughs> elite. Yeah. That Draymond's been... kind of knocking down the three this year. Like, very Bro, low key I was, I was... knocking down jumpers. <laughs> I was about to say, if he came to LA, he was going to have to hit, he was going to have to get that jumper back a little bit. He's going to have to give me something. He's shooting 46% from three. Not sustainable, but I'm just saying <laughs> that's he was, ridiculous. He was knocking him down last night and letting the Sacramento Kings bench know about it. I um, always say when Draymond Green hits a three pointer, game's it's caked. It's worth like one. it's worth like seven points when he makes it's it. It's more <laughs> demoralizing than a Steph Curry half court three. That's how strongly I feel about it. The crowd just loses their mind when it goes in, but he's been making them a lot. So maybe its power is not as strong. <laughs> uh, while we're talking about Draymond too, though, he did get a technical in the fourth quarter of this game. Uh, and the crowd kind of got lit. They got energized kind of off the back of that. And then the Kings immediately went on a 13 and three run. And that was the first time that they took the lead um, in this game that late in the fourth quarter, since the first time in the first quarter, um, they'd been yeah. down ever since. Um, obviously coming off of the heels of the five game suspension for putting a WWE move on Rudy Gobert. Um, <laughs> I want to ask you all like the antics at this point, 
in his career from Draymond with just like the full context of their season and their current situation. Like if you're Steve Kerr, like don't you got to like rein that in from him. I understand like that's him, but like it's costing y'all. Like you saw how reliant they are just historically on him to anchor their defense. Like their defense is so much worse when he's not playing. That took a big hit during that five game suspension. Um, and then just in general, the antics, like, doesn't feel like it's, it, it feels more hurtful, hurtful than helpful at this point. I think early on in his career, um, or just in the Warriors dynasty as a whole, he felt like he had to be that like protector force almost, but all these guys are well-established now. Like, I feel like it's just being a bigger detriment than anything else. My, my thing with that though, is kind of tough because like, to an extent, it's been hurt. Like, obviously, it's been helpful. You know, it gets the team going. He's kind of been that enforcer. Like, Definitely. that was his role his, his whole time. But, I mean, he got suspended in the finals. Like, it's hurt them at points even when he was effective. So, like, I say that to say, like, it's hard, especially if you're Steve Kerr, to go from, like, like analogy is like, all right, to be, like, a nice parent, you can go from, like, a mean parent and loosen up a little bit, become nice. You can't go from nice to, like, all right, now I'm a hard, like, strict parent. You can't do that. No. If you already let it go in the past, it's hard to now, like, I right, Draymond reeled in a little bit when you haven't reeled it in this his whole time with Golden State. And to his credit, like I said, certain times it's worked. It's got the team going. It's got the crowd going for them. So it's like it's hard to really reel it in now, even though it probably might be the right move. I'm going to say more often than not, we've seen Draymond's Draymond acting like Draymond work in their benefit. This was the mm. first time, though, when he hit him with the the, the chokehold with the with the sleeper <laughs> uh, that uh, that we saw Steve Kerr kind of say, what's going on? Draymond, you can't do that. That's the first time I felt like I've seen Steve Kerr be against something that Draymond has done on the court. That one was obviously blatant. You're kind of you're, you're tweaking Draymond. We'll calm it down. But I respect you defending a brother. But at the same time, you went a little bit over the top there. But I'm I've been pretty consistent with this. I think that Draymond brings that energy that almost nobody else can. That that Kevin Garnett type feel. That it's an old school type mentality that has worked for Draymond Green and the Golden State Warriors. I understand that we're finally seeing the Golden State Warriors not play the level of basketball we've seen. So maybe now it's the time to say, hey, let's calm it down. Let's relax. Let, let's maybe change things up to get back to where we were. But it's been working. We're talking about one of the greatest dynasties that this game's ever seen that's lasted longer than maybe fans may want to to, to see for sure. Uh, I'm saying this as someone who who doesn't like anything that's gone over there <laughs> in Golden State. But you can there's a certain level of respect and appreciation for what they've been able to do. And Draymond has been one of the main catalysts for the Golden State Warriors. So I, I've, I'm going to stay consistent in that regard. I respect Draymond being Draymond. Yeah, it, he definitely – you can't remove it because that's so much of his identity as a it's player. Fact. It's like, him. Yeah, you can't. Um, but like you said, there, there's been instances where it has, like, come to, to bite them in the finals, ass. He should have he should have chilled. All right, and so. all those technicals screwed him. I'm um, happy, but he <laughs> screwed him. Yeah, it, it does feel like something you do kind of just have to live with. Like, that is just – that's who he is. That's Draymond. Yep. Um, before we get off of this game, uh, let's talk about the Kings. Obviously, since they win, now they slot in at the two seed. Um, they're going to be taking on the Pelicans in the first round of the knockout stage in the in-season tournament. Um, De'Aaron Fox has been playing unbelievable basketball this year. He's so damn good. Um, we just talked about it on the episode on Monday, but when his three pointer is falling at the rate that it is, like he's got to be shooting like thirty-seven or thirty-eight percent now, probably after last night. What are you supposed to do, bro? Like genuinely, Nothing. what are you supposed to do? Nothing. Pray. Nothing. <laughs> like he, yeah, he's literally. so much faster um, than everybody on the court. Like the amount of blow bys he gets in games how crafty he is around the rim, his the touch and feel that he has in like the mid range short area, yep. like restricted area. He's just so ridiculously hard to guard. Um, and the way that this team is constructed on top of the fact, like no Keegan Murray, like hey, he's been hurt for a while. Um, like despite all of that, they have so much spacing, they have so much shooting. 
Um, they play um, with a lot of ball movement. Um, Mike Brown being a guy like a like we talked about, a Popovich tree descendant. Um, so big emphasis on spacing and ball movement and making the unselfish extra pass. Um, they've been playing really, really great basketball here as of late. Um, they're going to be taking on the Pelicans, who have had their number earlier in the year. I think they beat them back-to-back -back games um, not too long ago, maybe two weeks ago or so. Um, I don't know. What, what's y'all's pick for this this first quarterfinal here, Kings-Pelicans? Sneaky. I think the Pelicans definitely make it a better game than what we anticipate. I love – I love Zion. Zion's just one of my guys. Hopefully he plays. I know he's been inconsistent with the resting and, 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 and of course, being on the court. But I think in the knockout, we'll see him make that appearance. Very few people in the world can, can guard Zion Williamson. But what we've seen has been a little bit inconsistency with their offense. But when, with Trey Murphy, once he's back, of course. But you have Herb Jones, uh, Alvarado now coming back. It, it, the one thing that you worry about with the Pelicans is – their lack of size outside of a Valanciunas. You really don't have anybody else you can trust back there. But now CJ McCollum's coming back. We're seeing the ascension of Dyson Daniels early on in this season. The Kings have been playing some good basketball, though. I think this is going to be one of the better games in the knockout stages. Anything can happen in this type of situation where it's a winner go home. Ah, uh, you know what? I'm going to trust my gut here. I think the Pelicans pulled this one out. I think Brandon Ingram can have his way. Still don't trust the defense of the Sacramento Kings. And then Zion Williamson. No one's going to be able to hold him. He's going to be able to get his. 100%. I think it's, I think it's going to be a really good game. Like I said, I think it's going to be a good one. I, I don't know. I'm I'm leading the Kings, man. I'm leading the Kings. I think I want to ride with your guy, Billy, the high hand with De'Aaron Fox. I think, you know, built for these type Respect of moments, that. I understand. Like I said, it's not a playoff game, but, you know, winner go home. It's a big time game. So hey, great reigning clutch player to you. It, you know what I'm saying? I think, I, I, think like I want that. to ride with De'Aaron Fox. Like he is. That, bro. He's disgusting. And like I said, if the shot is falling. You can't. There's nothing you can do because you can't. You already can't stay in front of him, even if you sag off. So if like if you got to respect right. that, bro, you're cooked, bro. Uh, there's nothing you could do. So I, I think I'm going to ride with the Kings. But I, I for sure, though, I think it's going to be a good game. I think it's going to be a close one. Yeah, I think it's going to be a great game. I'm gonna, I am gonna. I kind of want to side with the Kings as well, um, even though I'm looking at the, the Pelicans are playing the Sixers right now. No one beat in this one. But Zion has 29 on 10 for 10 from the field with seven he's boards. A and five he's a GOAT. <laughs> I, he's the most disrespected best players that we've seen. All because – He's injury prone and he's a little mm -hmm. big. He's a little big. He probably could lose some weight. <laughs> but when he's when he's on the court, bro, he yep. is one of the best players, one of the most dominant. It's Giannis. It's it's Zion Williamson. That's it. That's yeah. the order. You can't deny that. Mm -hmm. You can't deny that. It's really just health. That's the that's the main thing. Just be on the court. Every, every time we've seen him on the court, he's been elite. You just need to be healthy, bro. That's why I just need Fact. honestly, I just need right. to see one good run from the Pelicans, like a, a healthy team. Zion's healthy, playing at their best. I just need to see at least one good run. I need also, to I didn't season. mean to disrespect my guy. Jordan Hawkins, too, has been one of the premier rookies Bro. this season. There's been – it's been Chet. It's been it's been Victor. But then in terms of scoring the basketball, Jordan Hawkins has been that guy that we really haven't been given enough love. Or I feel like media hasn't been given enough love to mm -hmm. Jordan Hawkins. One of those guys that I would have done anything for him to drop to 17 to my Lakers. Just a perfect 3 and D plug-in player can knock down a three ball. I think – let me make sure I'm not talking out of my ass. He's shooting almost eight attempts a game as a rookie. Eight attempts from three and shooting 38%. 37%, excuse me, as a rookie. That's how much trust they have in this kid early on in the season. I love Jordan Hawkins and everything that he can do on a basketball court. They got one of them. No, I said, I don't remember who they were playing. It might have been a couple weeks ago. But for him, like you said, to be a rookie and have that green light to just let it fly nice. with confidence, like, and coming out of UConn, like, obviously being one of the better shooters in this draft class, we talked about it recently, like, his jump form, his jumper form is so nice. It's so buttery. It's repeatable. Like, all mm -hmm. the things that you would want out of a sharpshooter, um, he has all of that at such a young age. And, like, He's only going to be able to add tools to his bag as he gets older, sure. more developed. Like, he's nice, bro. He is nice. Um, he but is. like, like y'all said, th this Pelicans team, they just got to put a healthy stretch together come, like, February through April and, like, get into the playoffs with some momentum. 
I, I got to see it because it's it's there's been too many what ifs with this, not even just Zion, but this roster as a whole. Was just right. kind of having this conversation too. If you go forward with the Pelicans, are you choosing Zion? Are you choosing Brandon? You, you have to take Zion. You, I, it feels crazy to not take Zion. The ceiling is too high feel, for Zion. And that's exactly how I feel too. I understand it's safer to go to Brandon Ingram out safer, but they don't talk about Brandon Ingram and his health problems also. He's not been one of the right. safest guys in terms right. of being there down in the, at the end of the season. To be fair to him, last two years, he's been there. He was one of the main reasons why they were able to, to get into the play-in last year too. But the ceiling with Zion, when he was on the court running the, the running the point guard, he was the, the point forward, I should say, point Zion. They were the number one team in the Western Conference over the Denver Nuggets. So we know that ceiling is much higher with the Zion as opposed to a Brandon Ingram. So that's why, again, I feel so strongly about this because you know how great he is when he's on the court. It's just a matter of him being on the court, and that's a fair question to be had. So this is what I'll say to that. Championship. I, that's all I have to say. Safe isn't going to win you a championship. No, right. no way. When Zion plays like right now today, it's not like we see flashes of like, oh, he could be this. He could be a dominant player. He is right yes. now today mm -hmm. a dominant player. Is when healthy one of the best players, one of the most unguardable players in basketball. And he's 23. Like it's <laughs> like we're time. talking about the ceiling. Like, time. We're talking about how high the ceiling can be. The floor is like ridiculously high right now, too. Yeah. Like you can't you 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 can't pass that up if you had to come to some crossroads to pick between one of the two. Like you, you have to go with Zion and like you have to. If it's if health ends up being an issue, like you can't control that. Like it's just out of your control at that point. But you got to take that chance. We just got to get Bro on Jenny Craig. That's it. You just get him on Jenny Craig. <laughs> oh, Jenny Craig. I heard that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's let's kick it around to the other Western Conference quarterfinal. Um, the Lakers winning every single game in the end season tournament nets them yeah, right. the one seed out west. And Too like you easy. said earlier. They will be taking on the Phoenix Suns, so we will get another iteration of the LeBron KD matchup. And I said I was going to do it earlier, so here, here is the, the Lakers segment. I want the both of y'all, whatever y'all want to talk about. I don't even got to be no, no setups or anything. <laughs> How are we feeling about not even just this game or the in-season tournament? How are we feeling about this Lakers season? And I'm going to sit my mic down and listen. Go ahead. Dan. Go ahead. I I, well, I was gonna actually have you go for it because the spot the pod okay. has heard me talk about they, okay, they know how okay, I feel okay. the Lakers. I'll reiterate it a little bit, but I'm genuinely curious. I don't get to speak to a lot of Lakers fans like that genuinely no ball. Uh -huh. I, I'm curious to see how you think, you know, what's your insight on the season so far. So I was talking to you boys before the show started. I said, I'm in heaven compared to last season, the way that we started two and ten. We were in hell as Laker fans. I'm getting I'm getting nothing but just disgusting tweets sent to me. My notifications just anytime the Lakers do anything, anytime AD hits the floor, I'm getting my mentions flooded with just people just negative, negative, negative comments. And now this year, right now, what is it? 11 and 11 and 8 now after this game versus the Pistons. I can't complain not even a little bit. I'm seeing LeBron James shoot almost 40% from 3. On the amount of attempts that he's taken at the age of 30. Crazy. He's going to be 39 in a couple of weeks. This is year 21. We're spoiled. We're spoiled. The one thing I'll say, one thing I'll say is we still, I would love to see the free throw translate, but that's just been kind of just the story of LeBron's career. I can't right. nitpick too much. He's been way too great for way too long. But seeing Austin Reeves go to the bench and still give us high-level production, leading the league off the bench in rebounds and assists. I think that he was getting a little bit too much hate early on in the season for his what, four-game struggles. He's come into his own very nicely as well. Anthony Davis, defensive side of the ball, we know what we're getting. He's one of the best defenders in the game, in my opinion. Maybe not this season. So far, he hasn't been the best defender, but I think that when he's 100% and he's locked in, that is the best defender in the game. 
D'Lo when he's on playing trash teams. Let's be real. I would still love mm-hmm. to see against some high level competition in the playoffs, but he's been playing some good ball. Cam Reddish, ever since that miss versus Miami, he's been one of the bright spots of the yeah, squad right. defensively all season. Even before that Miami game, he's been locked in on the perimeter. We've been doing this without Vando. We've been doing this without Rui for a little bit too. We are not even at 100%. And we're still playing some high-level basketball. The issue is they're still that kind of same old Lakers where we're playing really good teams and we'll play like shit for the first three quarters. I'm sorry if, if we don't curse on this podcast. I'll try to limit myself. We'll nah, play like good. garbage for the first three quarters. We'll play like, for, like trash for the first three quarters. Quarter four. Here we are. We turn it on. Now we're that team that we've been seeing throughout the entirety of the season. Saw it last year too. And I, that's one of those things that I wish I could change. But beggars can't be choosers because we're playing we're playing teams that we should smash. We've been smashing them. The Blazers, uh, the Grizzlies, Utah, right now the Pistons. That's what I've been happy to see. Love the young guys coming in and doing a job. Max Christie has been really cool so far. Christian Wood hasn't been that defensive presence, which obviously we've known. But offensively, he's been giving us some valuable minutes. I love what I'm seeing from the Lakers. I really have very little complaints. Mm-hmm. Only thing if I had to nitpick would be the consistency of Anthony Davis's offensive game. Defensively, we know he's like that. Offensively, I just need to see the explosiveness every night. Now, I saw someone tweet this. I want to give him his credit. I want to say it's it's Jay something. I'll give him his credit after I'm done speaking. But he said the biggest mistake that the Lakers made was making AD gain weight so he could play the true five. And I think that also came in due part when we're going up against Jokic, and Jokic is obviously just dominating that matchup. He's just so much bigger and stronger than AD is. I do agree. I think what we should have done was go get a real dominant paint presence, a a true center that can defend the bigger body in the paint, and have AD play that true four that he wants to play. Because when he was at his best in New Orleans, he was getting his, he was elusive, he was quick, he was able to hit the mid-range, get to the bucket, just be quicker than those bigger defenders that are playing on him. We really haven't seen that out of AD so far this season. Remember coming in when they said we want AD to take six threes a game? Where the hell has that been? He's not shooting the three ball almost at all. That's what's kind of bothered me. But I still trust in AD, of course. That's one of my favorite players in the game. I know how talented he is. I just need to see the consistency. But outside of that, how can we complain? It's almost impossible. Yeah. So the, the, I, I really want to talk about the AD thing because I, I pretty much agree. I feel like trying to make him a traditional center when that's not his strong suit makes it a little bit tough because it takes it away a little bit from his offensive game. Like I said, not as explosive, sure. can't be as consistent. And it's like he's going to be at the center, and he's Yoke is still going to get his. So, like, these other, like, premier bigs are still going to sure. get theirs anyway. So it's like we might as well play to his strong suit and have him at the four and allow him to be more explosive, more at least a little bit more consistent offensively. But at the end of the day, that's kind of been AD's, like, MO a little bit. He's going to be inconsistent. That's just kind of who he is. But on the defensive end, he's still going to be solid for you. But as far as like the season as a whole, I pretty much feel the same because mainly because we've been so like ravaged with injuries and the fact that we're still able to, you know, stay afloat, beat the bad teams that we're supposed to, even though we haven't been able to have our full team together once all season. Mm-hmm. So we never mm-hmm. like I've seen people get on the rotations, get on Darvin Ham about a lot of things. It's like we have we don't even know what our full team is gonna look like all together because we're not yep. we've been killed with injuries. Somebody somebody comes back, another person goes down. We haven't had yep. Vando. Rui's hurt. Cam Reddish was Gabe hurt for Vincent. a little part of the season. That's Gabe Vincent. Two. That's what I'm so we haven't really got to see the full team all together to know exactly. All right, this is going to be the rotations. Um, this is going to be the closing lineups. We haven't really got to see that. So as far as being able to like stay afloat and beat those teams with all the injuries that we have, I can't complain too too much. I really can't. And as far as like you know being inconsistent in some of the games, like letting up some leads or like coming back and not closing some of these games. I, I feel like that'll come. Like, I feel like we'll be fine. Like, it's a LeBron James-led team. At the, end of the, at the end of the day, we'll be fine. But overall, season as a whole, um, can't really complain too much, especially because, like I said, we've been getting killed with injuries so far. Yeah, that game versus the the Sixers, definitely one that I'm taking, crumbling up, uh, hook shot into the what trash. What game are you talking about? Exactly. What are you talking exactly. about? I don't, I, I, that, huh? That's a fact. I don't, I don't even know – I, I think I, I I'm maybe my memory's failing. Maybe I don't even remember season. it all too clearly. <laughs> facts. Yeah. Uh, but really outside of that, when we're played some good teams, uh, 
Houston, we played twice. We lost once. We got smoked once. We handled business the second time. But again, we played we played relatively sloppy, but was able to close mm-hmm. out in that quarter. Going up against Dallas, that's a epit- that's the epitome of three quarters of BS basketball locking in in that fourth quarter. When we played the Clippers, when we finally broke that streak, we were able to lock it in that fourth quarter. Again, I just need to see it throughout the four quarters when we're playing high-level teams just right. because I want to see how we match up against these high-level teams, which I know we can contend against anyone. But show it to me that we can dominate a game all four quarters so it's not just in the last minutes of the game, like in the Suns as well. The Suns match is one of those where we were able to just lock in at the very end and close out that game. It can't just be that in the fourth quarter we're relying on LeBron James to get the job done for us. It needs to be that the guys are doing their job as a collective that come the fourth the fourth quarter, LeBron's rested and ready to go if that need is to be there for him to do that job. But, yeah, outside of that, Lakers have been been playing some really solid basketball. Just need to be a little bit more consistent. Yeah, because because those good teams too later in the season and in the playoffs are not going to let up those fourth fourth quarter all no week way. rally. They're not going to let it up. So we got to be just better like all throughout all phases of the game. So other That's than that, funny. I pretty much agree. Look, y'all said it all. I had, <laughs> every little note question I had, y'all just went and covered all of it perfectly. I was going to ask about how y'all feel about Dartmouth Ham. So I see people get on him and his rotations all the time. The health, the injuries. He's a baby Steve Kerr. Very low-key, he's a baby Steve Kerr, and I mean that in the sense of (laughs) his rotation choices are a little questionable, but that's not his fault. It's not his fault that it's a constant carousel of people being in and out of the lineup, and he's just trying his best early on in the season to find what what we can glue together and what can stick. So I like Darvin Ham. I think that he's a good coach. I just think that his rotations can be a little questionable at times, uh, drawing up that play for Cam Reddish ended up being a blessing in disguise where now Cam has been really locked in. But in that situation, draw up a play for AD, draw up a play for LeBron. Ironically, you look at that game versus the Mavericks where we kind of threw, we, we drew up the play for AD, even though AD was scoreless in the second half. That's one of those. Mm-hmm. I want to see LeBron, who was the reason we got back into the game to take care of the ball. I guess maybe I should take away from that. LeBron needs to be the one to take the last second shot. But that's kind of been the story of his career where he's trying to make the smart play. But, yeah, Darvin definitely has been good. I definitely am not worried about him too much just because the carousel that has been our lineup. I I, got to ask you this now that we got like a a diehard LeBron fan on the pod. I got to ask you this. Uh How, How do you feel about the whole like right play thing? Like just make the right basketball play late into the game. How do you feel about that? There's been moments where I want him to be selfish, no doubt about it. I'd be lying to you if I said otherwise, but he's so much smarter than the average basketball fan that who the hell am I to say, oh, LeBron, (laughs) don't pass to Cam Reddish, who's absolutely wide open in the corner, no hand in sight. He is just he, he has all the time in the world to get that shot off. How am I to be upset at that? Of course, we've seen it throughout time where. He, he's given passes up. He's given shots to other guys. You're making the smart basketball play. That is 100% okay with me. Look at Jordan in the finals. We saw Paxson with Jordan passing the ball to him, passing the ball to a Steve Kerr. He made the right basketball play. He was rewarded from it. We've seen moments where LeBron has trusted his teammates. He's made the right basketball play. He's come up a bit short, and that's where – he gets blamed because he didn't win the game. If Jordan mm-hmm. passed to Scotty, or excuse me, if he passed to Kerr, he passed to Paxson and they missed, maybe, you know, history could be a little bit different and maybe we wouldn't be propping it up as much. However, he had the, of course, that these two guys were solid role players, were able to knock down those shots. It's LeBron had his teammates make a couple more shots. Maybe we aren't making that much of a deal about it. But LeBron also has how many playoff buzzer beaters? How many game-winning shots? He's one of the most clutch players in NBA history, even while choosing to make the best basketball play on top of it. So to me, I think it's overblown. But again, I'd be lying to you if I said I didn't want to be a little bit more selfish. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, using it as a as a knock to say he's not clutch is crazy to me. That oh, that never made sense. Oh, but like, he's, just... he's put that to bed so many times. <clears throat> Yeah, that that just doesn't make sense. But like, I I, I get what you mean because certain times when I'm watching the game and I'm just like, like it's easy to say after the fact too. When they miss, true, it's so true. easy to be like, oh, you should just went up. You should have just did it because if they made the shot, no one's saying anything. Like, were you all. on him but, for passing to Cam? 
that it's some, the Laker fan in me sometimes is just like, bro, I want you to take it. Like, it's a good pass. <laughs> yeah, it's a good yeah, pass. Right. It's a good play. I feel like, you. I feel damn. you. Damn. Like, but I mean, it, it, a lot of times that is the good play though. Like, uh, like even in um in twenty twenty when he passed away, wide open Danny Green that was at the top yep. of the key. There's no one around him. Like that's a I I had no fault of him passing that up, even For though sure. I wanted him to make it. I think LeBron had like what forty something that game. That was, was like killing. Supposed that was yeah. That was gonna be a historic game. If, if Danny Green hit that shot, that was gonna be oh my god, it'd been crazy. But I mean, it's it, it is the right play. Like sometimes I have my fan the moment where I'm just like, Brian, you're the best player. Like. I understand Cam Reddish is wide open. I love Cam Reddish, but it's Cam Reddish. Like you're LeBron, I want you you're to LeBron. take the shot. So it, yeah, you know it, it's it's tough, but it is the right basketball play. And like, like I said, it's a lose lose because if he goes up and he misses it, there's gonna be people on Twitter pointing out, "Oh my God, Cam Reddish was wide open over here. Why didn't LeBron pass it?" So at the end of the day, if they miss the shot, it's a lose lose. LeBron is already one of the most scrutinized, not even basketball players, athletes figures period yeah playing on the most scrutinized nba organization everything that happens is going to get blown so far out of proportion by the media um That's the truth. But yeah never thought about it like that but that is definitely a great hmm. perspective you can't please yeah, well, everyone and that's the truth no you definitely can't um but no i i agree with y'all like him making the right basketball play like if I was a Laker fan. I would live and die on that hill 10 times out of 10. It's Definitely. LeBron. Like, mm. that's what you have to do. And what you said, him not being clutch, how, how do you think LeBron so happened? <laughs> Where do they think that Talk game to him. <laughs> talk to him. Um, hey. You know what um, they don't talk about that kind of bothers me? Which that one? Game seven shot versus San Antonio over Kawhi Leonard, the guy who supposedly has his number. They don't talk about that game winning shot, game ceiling shot. To end the to end the championship, to win the NBA Finals, I don't know. That's one that that kind of bothers me a little bit that they don't talk about enough. But that's one of the most clutch shots of LeBron's career. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get sidetracked too much, but since you brought up Kawhi, I have to say, like I'm I live in San Antonio right now. I've never seen a city like have so much hatred for a player still for like it feels like the most random reason i guess it's not random like it is the whole they feel like he quit on the team uh -huh. but we never discussed on the pod like the whole popovich getting on the mic and telling the crowd to stop booing at Kawhi at the free throw that line and like they booed louder like i don't <laughs> to see that happen one is crazy because is that even legal? Like, can coaches grab the PA <laughs> mic? Like, why That's don't when you're pop do that it, you get away with a lot? When you're pop, he, he, you about to say get... he didn't care. He he could have yeah. got fined. Like, pop don't care. <laughs> pop does not care. I promise you that. But like, like, could you imagine if like the the, the crypto center was a little dry and Darvin Ham just like grabbed the mic and was like, bro, come on, turn it up. Like, it's definitely a only pop can do that thing. And I also say I support Pop in that. Kawhi Leonard helped bring a championship to San Antonio. Thank you. Of course, your mm. your historic franchise, you you have a, a lot more championships than the one Kawhi helped you win. But he's a Finals MVP. He played some high level basketball with you. Gave you MVP caliber seasons with you. He got injured. He really couldn't play. Quote: You want to say he quit? I feel like that's that's that leaves a bad taste in in in, in my mouth thinking about that. But now Kawhi Leonard in San Antonio should be remembered as nothing short of a great basketball player and a winning player at that too. Right. And to say that you feel like he quit when, as we've seen in all the other stops that he's made, like he's had multiple other knee injuries. Yeah. A lot of them feel like could stem from that initial injury. Um, was it, why am I blanking on the name? Zaza, like landing on his Zaza, ankle. Yep. yep. Um, so it's like, do you really feel like he quit? Like he wouldn't just be making these injuries up. It's not benefiting him at this point. Right. Um, just a wild situation. About, something I forgot about too, that year that the Warriors won 73 games, the the Spurs won, I think 67 games. They Kawhi did. That was, really a, they was, that was a tight series. And what, the shit that like sucks is that we didn't, we, they were up 20 something points, 20 something points. And they lost that game too. Damn. Yeah, it's a, that, it's a uh, shitty, it's a shitty ending, honestly. 
Mm. Definitely. I don't like the Spurs. They they gave my my guys <laughs> some fits. I can't say that, but I I pay respect and acknowledge that they are and they were an amazing team at that point in time. Yeah. I just think it's crazy because it's like when you have fan bases that really hate an individual player, like some of it, like not, I guess you get it to an extent. I don't even want to bring up like the Knicks and the Trey Young stuff. Like that also feels like that you got to let that go. It is. It is. But it's New York. Like, it's not going nowhere. <laughs> right. Um, but it's like, bro, to the extent where it's like, bro, I had professors that I would talk to that like, you know, they really hate Kawhi. Like, Really, they do not rock with this dude down here. Like, talk to any Spurs fan and bring up his name. It's like, nah, bro, don't talk about him. Like, <laughs> don't <laughs> rock with him like that. Uh, it, it's just that crazy. makes no sense. That makes no sense. I, I don't get it. I, I've tried to ask about it, and that's all I can get is that they feel like he quit on the team, so they they don't have any respect for him as a player. Maybe if he didn't win a chip. I'd understand that, but he helped deliver and a finals a MVP. That's what final I'm saying. MVP. Like, how ungrateful can you be? There's teams that don't even have a finals appearance. What are we doing? Right. Facts. Crazy. To bring it back on track, um, I'm not even going to ask y'all who y'all going to pick in the Lakers Suns game. Uh, I know y'all both have Come LA. On. Come on, uh, okay. yeah. Come on. Now. <laughs> um. I Bradley Bill's status for that game is still up in the air. Still haven't even seen the Phoenix big three play together this year. Which is crazy. But it feels like it's going to be a, a tight game either way. If you have Bradley Bill and KD in a winner go home scenario, like D book is ridiculous. I feel like his game has taken almost another leap this year. Are you going like, with the Suns? I, well, that's what it sounds I, like. I almost want, I, I want to say I don't want to take a cop out and feel like it's just a toss up, but it really does kind of feel like a 50 50. Stand on it, man. Pick, I it, pick the Suns and just... stand on it, Billy. But no, Bill <laughs> is tough, bro. <laughs> like, They've like, been playing good basketball, just KD and Book. I can acknowledge that. They have been playing some have. really good basketball. What is it? It's like some like seven wins in a row, something something like that. They were they until um, they lost uh, against Toronto just now. Oh, they lost tonight. Okay, yeah. But Booker shot two for twelve this game too. That's crazy. Um, but like the shot he made against the Knicks, it literally looks like the shot out of that new Nike commercial. <laughs> it's like they're yeah, triple teaming yeah. him on the wing and he just fade away and hit it. Um, so look, gun to my head, I got to pick. I'll take the Lakers because look, 40% from three LeBron is scary, bro. That is, He's the goal. I never thought we would see something like that <laughs> before. Um, so I'll take Our the six Lakers. Six attempts but... a game too. That's, that's what's exciting. Six attempts a game and shooting 40% is crazy. It is wild. It is wild. I, I, if you would have told me that LeBron would be shooting 40% from three ever, like consistently, <laughs> I don't think I would believe you. Like that's an insane number to be hitting and to be doing it at 39. Never seen him. I'm spoiled. spoiled. I'm that's spoiled. why I do. we are He's really spoiled. On. People, I hate when people be like, bro, stop bringing up his age, stop bringing up the year. But this is not normal, bro. And we keep saying it because it's not normal, bro. You don't see this, and you're probably not going to see it again. Not in any sport. Like, this is not something that is. Right. Typical. I guess the closest thing we saw was Brady, but he's not running. It's different. Jumping right. the yeah. way that LeBron James is. Like, like. It really is one of one. We've never seen it, anything like this. His head still gets above the rim, like, easily. Like, people his age that dunk, like, it's like the rim grazer package off 2K. That's all they got. <laughs> he out, he's still out here, windmill, rock the cradle. Like, he's got all the dunk packages still available. It's We really are, like, living at a special time to be able to see that. I think about, for the people who got to watch like Kareem or Jordan, it's like, dang, this is our generation's like generational talent. <laughs> That's why I, I always, I always say this to my pops. He's the luckiest guy I know. 
Got to see the Yankees dominate. Got to see Jordan. Got to see Magic. Got to see Bird. Got to see Kobe and Shaq. Got to see LeBron. He's gotten to see it all. Got to Man. see uh, the the Niners dominate. The Cowboys dominate. He's a Dolphin fan, so th- it's a little bittersweet. He didn't. His guy Marino never won a championship, yeah. uh, but he's seen, of course, now LeBron James. I mean, what what more? Or excuse me, for football, Tom Brady. I he's seen everything. So there's certain fans that have been spoiled more than others, but I still can't. I can't be ungrateful. I, I got to see my greatest of all time in this generation dominate for going on 21 years. It's something that is insane. Hey, you don't got to stop at your generation. That's the greatest of all time, period. Talk about it. Talk mm. about it. <laughs> mm-mm, mm-mm. We don't got to get into that. No go debate right now. I about to say that could go. That could go on for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, uh, let's get to the two matchups in the East really quick. Um, first one, the one seeded bucks who took down the Miami heat. And what I said earlier was playoff atmosphere basketball. And I, I have to give credit to Bam out of bio who off of the heels of their finals run last year, when I, we said it, when these are like the early, early episodes of the podcast that his offense really impressed me. During their entire postseason stretch, it feels like he really took on um, and shouldered some additional weight offensively. And it feels like it's carried on to this season. And not even just like from a purely stat perspective, it's how he's scoring his feel for the game. Um, I saw him hit a little shimmy fade last night. I was Act. like, bro, yep. Yep. Bam is looking. He's just moving differently on offense on top of being – arguably if not the most versatile defender on the opposite side of the ball. So I have to definitely give him his flowers Um, was a very, very tough fought game all the way to the very, very end, but the bucks squeak it out. Dame had some huge shots down the stretch. Chris Middleton got it going down the stretch, which was really nice to see because he's had a a bit of a rough go at it earlier on this year and dealing with some injuries as well. Um, And Giannis was doing Giannis things. The spin move on Josh Richardson, um, absolutely ridiculous like you have the complete mix of like finesse and just pure dominance um so the bucks look their defense still have question marks but look at the end of the day wins are wins they're sitting at 13 and 5 they wrapped up the one seed in the the knockout stage of the in-season tournament and they're gonna be taking on a scrappy knicks team jalen brunson has also been playing out of his mind as of late um he just is another guy that it's like in the clutch. You need a bucket. He feels like a guy that is going to go and get you that bucket. Definitely, He's been playing phenomenally. Mitchell Robinson has been having a great season. One of the best offensive rebounders in the game. One of the best uh, rim protectors in the game. Um, the defensive impact really just his overall impact. I don't even have to just limit the defense. His overall impact that he brings on this Knicks team um, really can't be understated. Julius Randle has strung together some better performances, which is good to see because it was looking uh, abysmal, <laughs> abysmal to start the season. Um, uh, and I think he had a 2020 game last night too. So good shout out to him. Um, but this is a game that I feel like of all the matchups, this is the one that I think is the sneakiest. Like I almost kind of want to take the Knicks. Like it feels okay. like a time where, like I just said, if it comes down close down the wire, like the Bucks got their guy, it's going to be Dame down the stretch. The Knicks got their guy. It's going to be Brunson down the stretch. And A, I want to see that as a basketball fan, but I just think it could be close enough that one or two shots go to the Knicks' way. And then you're looking at the Knicks going into the semifinals of the end season tournament. But I want to turn it over to y'all and see what y'all think about, about that matchup. Yeah, I mean, honestly, um, I think it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be a good matchup. As far as who I'm picking, it, it's for me, it's so tough to pick against any team with Damian Lillard and Giannis on the same side. But like you said, the it's defense not. still, de- it definitely concerns me though, um, because even in the games that they win, right, they've, I'm, mean, they've been able to win them for sure. But it's like the defense that that's what sticks out to me. Like obviously, when they get it going offensively, they have like a great duo and also great pieces around them as well. So like a really good team in general. But the defense is what scares me. Um, the Knicks are a scrappy team. Like you said, they do have their guy in Brunson. But at the end of the day, I feel like they're at a point now where they're – I don't think they have it figured out. 
But they're, you know, as the game goes on, as they're playing more together to get, you know, more chemistry and things like that, I think they'll get it going a little bit more. Um, Because right now, I mean, honestly, every time with every team, when you add a star player in there, it's always going to take, it's always going to be an adjustment period. It's always going to be some time that you need to, you know, get the cohesion right, you know, figure out how to get, how to get going, like in Damian Lillard's case, how to get going, because he's never played with somebody who was better than him on the same team as him, so how to play that second fiddle a little bit, even though he is the closer down the stretch. But at the end of the day, I love the talent on the team. I love those two guys. I do trust Damian Lillard down the stretch. I obviously trust Giannis in general. Um, so yeah, I think I'll pick with. I think I'll stick with the Bucks. I understand the logic of picking the Knicks right now. Top five defense, a top, if not top ten, just outside of the top ten of offense, and that's with Julius Randle putting up tour dates and playing inconsistent. But like you mentioned, getting on track recently, uh, that's been huge for them. Jalen Brunson shooting forty seven percent from three. He is one of the premier point guards in the game. More so, he's a guard. I don't call him a point per se because he's really not facilitating this offense. He's just mm. a pure bucket getter. He's been awesome so far to start this season. Really like what I've been seeing out of RJ for sure. You mentioned Mitchell Robinson already, giving him his love. So I understand that logic because defensively, we're really seeing the Knicks lock down on that side of the ball. And then offensively, if you want to keep it that close of a game and, and we're seeing Milwaukee struggle defensively the way that they are, I wouldn't be surprised to see the Knicks sneak this one and, and, and take this one in a one-game winner-take-all type situation. I think I'm with you, Billy. I think I'm leaning with the Knicks in this one. And I really like Milwaukee. It's just a one-game type situation where we know that we've seen Dame come up big. And, of course, Giannis is going to dominate. But Mitchell Robinson on the other side, they could put a, a wall-type deal with with Julius Randle, with a, with a Mitchell Robinson, and, and really try and limit Giannis and his ability to, to dominate down low. But on the opposite side, on the, in the perimeter, you still have QG, Josh Hart, Dante DiVincenzo, who's been mm-hmm. playing some really good basketball for them. Also, there's guys that can defend at, at the top of the key for them, too. And then you mentioned Middleton, who got it going late in this game versus Miami. I kind of left that game feeling if Jimmy Butler was playing, I think Miami wins that ball game. Bam Adebayo was playing some great basketball, hitting his middies. You mentioned that little shimmy, ah, 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 go over the top Mm mid-range, kind of like a close shot. But regardless, still got in and still made his buckets and and was huge. And defensively, Bam Adebayo, he's been one of those guys I had to change my tune on. I really didn't love his offensive game. I felt like he's been limited. But if he can hit that mid-range and kind of space the floor a little bit in that regard, he's been an awesome playmaker at the big. He's obviously an elite defender, too. Bam Adebayo has been one of those I had to to eat some words and really realize that, yo, this is one of the premier centers in the game. But I still like what I've been seeing out of Milwaukee on the offensive side of the ball. Finally, Damian Lillard has put together a string of games where he's been dominant offensively. Giannis is going to get his regardless. Seeing Middleton get, get, get a little life behind him too. Brooke Lopez has been, I think he had his career high, 39 points a couple nights ago too. We know that he still has some left up his sleeve even at his old age, but the defense is a worry. I think I got the Knicks in this one. Doesn't this team feel like they embody Knicks culture so much? Definitely. Like of all the Definitely. rosters 100%. that they've had in a long time, like to have scrappy guys like Josh Grind. Oh. Right, QG, like Mitchell Robinson, Harnstein coming off the bench can give you great Back. minutes. Uh, Emmanuel quickly has an argument to be the sixth man of the year right now after yep. season ended today. Him. Like, mm-hmm. bro, this roster is loaded, they're scrappy, they're gritty, they've got they embody their coach. Like, it, it just it, it's good to see the Knicks in this position. Like, it's always better for any of the leagues when you have those big market historic franchises playing good basketball or good football or really in any of the sports, like just Mm -hmm. being at the top echelon um, in in the league. And so it's good for the Knicks to be like this. Um, And yeah, I I, I think they could sneak this one out. I do think they could sneak it out for sure. Um, The last game here in the the first round of the the knockout bracket is going to be the two seeded Pacers who did also go 4-0 in group play. Um, against, which is crazy that their consolation prize for not losing in the in-season tournament is the Celtics. <laughs> Celtics. <laughs> crazy. Um, and, and super tough, but uh, we did a whole long segment on the Pacers on Monday, so I don't want to rehash all of it too much, but um, look, historic offense, like not even just number one 
offensive rating in the league right now. It would be the highest offensive rating of all time by a decent margin. The pace that they play with, Tyrese Halliburton is – I don't even have adjectives. Like, it is insane to see him play the way that he does um, with the freedom that he does. To have a five-assist-to-turnover ratio while averaging 12 assists is crazy. Be putting up 26 points a night on shooting almost 46% from three. Like Jesus Christ. It's, it's so ridiculous. Nuts, Numbers are like fake. He puts up my career stat lines night in, night out. Like we kind of joked around in the offseason that he's a guy that you could really like, or he could sleepwalk to like 20 and 12 night in, night mm-hmm. out. But like maybe we undershot it. Like he feels like he could sleepwalk to like 25, 26 and 12. And on any given night, go off for like 30 plus, 15 plus assists. Like he's playing at an unbelievable level. And then obviously on the other side, the Celtics are just, they're a machine, bro. They're a juggernaut. Uh, it's not fair. Right. <laughs> well, we, I talked about it not too long ago that I feel like they're the most versatile, versatile team in basketball. I, I still feel the same way. Um, obviously, the Przingis injury is not great for that. Um, but even still, like they have guys that will step up. Al Horford will step up in that role. Um, and this core has been together for so long. They've been around the block. They've been in so many deep playoff runs. Like this winner go home environment is not going to do anything for them. Um, so I have the Celtics in this one, which is unfortunate because I really did want to see the Pacers make a run at this. But it's, it's a tough draw as you run into them in the first round. Um, but I have the Celtics in this quarterfinal matchup. It's crazy too like in the we're... offseason. Oh, my fault, my fault. I, all I had no, to say ahead, crazy yeah. in the offseason, people were kind of getting on me when I talked about the Celtics, Billy. And I was like, when the Przingis trade first happened, I'm like, I think this this is like the best roster in basketball on paper because of the versatility, just because he adds a different level of scoring, different way of scoring to this offense rather than just um iso ball between jb and jt for the most part like it's a different level of scoring he still adds the rim protection like i think it's funny because now people are kind of coming around and seeing like this team is so versatile like they have a bunch of different guys who can go off for you any night and all of those guys on all offensive end are still elite defenders are still great on the defensive end so yeah same thing I, i'm picking the celtics even though I, <laughs> terry's halliburton is so fun to watch and the pacers in general just the like running gun fast pace like run up and down, shoot a lot of threes. Like it's, it's so fun to watch. So, but I think at the end of the day, I, I've got to pick the Celtics. Yeah. You mentioned it. Porzingis not being there kind of sucks because obviously he brings just a different element to the, to the Boston Celtics, that pick and pop, mm-hmm. that pick and roll. They virtually become unstoppable with Porzingis because of how versatile he is as an offensive player. Defensively, they're one of the best defensive teams in the, in the, in the league. You mentioned the versatility. Look at Derek White on any given night can be the second best player on the Boston Celtics, a Derek White. Right. And I don't want to sound like I'm disrespecting. It's just a team that has Porzingis, Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum. That is just a next level depth that they do have where they just have a riches of talent on their squad. I It is unfortunate for the Pacers. Number one offense, like I mentioned earlier in the show, they're playing with the fastest pace, like Dame just mentioned, number one in the league. It is unfortunate that you go undefeated and now you got to go up and play the best team in the league, in my opinion. <laughs> well, second best team. I respect the healthy Denver Nuggets. But, yeah, it'll be a good game. I think it'll be a better game than what we think. Of course, winner take all. Anything can happen. But the Boston Celtics are just at a level that other teams aren't. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous to watch them. It feels like Chris Stapps is like that, that last infinity stone. Like he really could be what they needed to get over to home just in the all the different ways that he can provide scoring for them. And, like, let's not sleep on his rim protection either. Like, I would True. hope being seven foot three, like, yeah, you could guard the rim pretty well. But um, he does bring that element uh, for Boston as well. Um, so hopefully his, the calf injury for him isn't, isn't too, too serious. Um, but, yeah, this I, I'm excited. I'm really excited for the, the group rounds. And now that we've seen, like, how the environments have been, um, for not the group rounds, sorry, the knockout rounds, mm-hmm. but how the environments were for the group rounds. Um, I really am excited to see like how fans in the arena react to like when we get close down the stretch in these winter go home knockout round games. Like I feel like it's really like this is going to be as close to playoff basketball without it being 
the first round of the playoffs um, that the NBA is going to get. And then I'm really, really interested to see what that championship game is like, that 83rd game that doesn't really count for the schedule. But then you have obviously that half a million dollar incentive for everybody on the roster. Like, Mm -hmm. what is that going to feel like from an encore perspective? And then obviously it being in Vegas, like what type of fan engagement are they going to get there? I think there's a lot, a lot for the league that is good off of this initial run. And there's still like so much, I think that they could tap into to kind of grow it and develop it more. Um, I've seen people toss around trying to add different incentives, like maybe bumping lottery odds or, or things like that to the winner, just to make it a little bit more meaningful. I don't know if, Tinkering with that is necessarily the right route, but th there definitely are different ways. I think that Adam Silver and the league will, will grow it in the years to come. But between this and the plan, like these new additions are like just great for the game and just adds sure. more meaningful competitive basketball, uh, which is, I mean, like for a diehard fan is great, but it's really good at engaging the casual fan more frequently throughout the season, which I know is their, their goal um, of putting the end season tournament in the first place. And, and yeah. you know people are going to use that in legacy debates too. Let's say, oh yeah, let's say yeah. the Lakers go and they win this first one. You already know, hey, and LeBron won the inaugural uh, <laughs> tournament too. Don't forget about that. So yeah, no, of course, it, it, it is dependent on who wins it too. Like if the Pacers are are going to be one of those teams that wins, it'd be like ah, it's the Pacers regular season. It is what it is. Right. They won't think too much about it. But if the Celtics go and win it, Milwaukee. Uh, the Lakers, I'll even throw the Kings in there because they earned our respect like that. It's one of those that are the Knicks. Let, I, let me not disrespect New York either. So it's definitely going to be interesting to see which team wins because I feel like that'll drive narratives also. Definitely, definitely. Um, one of the last things I'll say about it, the only thing I do wish, and I don't want to turn this into like they have to add more teams, but it was tough because, like, for a team like the Magic, who had already played all of their games, they were sitting at three and one already. I feel like it's hard because then the Celtics get to go into the last, they get to go into their game on Tuesday night, know what point differential they have yep. to get to, and like it's unfortunate they got the the Bulls to wrap up their their in season mm -hmm. tournament run, but they got to just bully up on a team that needs to push the like the reset button three years ago. Like, Bad, yeah. <laughs> um. So. I, I don't know if they need to add more teams. And it's also harsh because it's like head to head, the Magic beat the Celtics in their East in season tournament True. matchup. So it's like, I know you don't want to necessarily rely at all on just head to head. It's not really how group play works, but and there has to be another happy medium between, I think, just the point differential. Um, because it's it is tough for teams like there's probably, I think, like three or four different three and one teams that did not end up making this the final cut. I know the Nets were one of them. Magic was another one. I know I missed another one off the top of my head. Um, but they all just, just ended up losing out on point differential. So um, I'm interested to see if they tweet that moving forward because that also I know was like hectic trying to keep up like on Twitter, figuring out what teams need to do or how much they need to win by like in real time. The TNT broadcast was trying to do a good job of like keeping us like tapped in around the league. But it's a little hectic and hard to try to keep up with. Um, but like I said, overall, it wasn't going to be perfect, but I don't, I really don't think you could have asked for more from this first iteration of the, the end season tournament. Yeah. I'm looking at it now. Yeah. The the Cavaliers were three and one. They missed out. Uh, mm -hmm. The magic and the nets, both three and one. They both missed out. Minnesota was three and one. They missed yep. out a lot of good teams. And the nets sneakily three and one, two in the play in the end season tournament too. So, yeah, mm -hmm. some good teams that just missed out. Maybe you're right. You do add some more teams into the end season knockout, make it a little bit prolong it right up until that that Christmas break. And then you have Christmas Day basketball. That would be more of an exciting thing regardless because it is Christmas Day and everyone's tuned into basketball then. And that's – you have, what, th two, three weeks in that period? So if you want to add game or add teams, I think that the time period is long enough that you can get away with it. All right. And hey, look. If Adam Silver steals this, y'all know y'all heard it here first. Mm -hmm. Talk. Like it wouldn't, Act. I wouldn't. It wouldn't be too crazy if, right, we extend out that in-season tournament to a point where that championship game is like in that prime time Christmas Day slot. Who good wouldn't want? Right that? Who That's wouldn't a want? Half a, right who wouldn't want half a mil on Christmas Day? I would. That is <laughs> right. <laughs> That's it right there oh. for sure. I like that. 
So look, it, look. If if Adam Silver steals an A, we know he listens to the pod. So that's it. <laughs> but, but B, I'll know that y'all y'all heard it here first. But I like that. I think that that would be good. Um, and even if it like again, if it lives in that, it's not a regular season game. That's enough of an incentive. On top of the fact that it's going to be a Christmas Day matchup, like you know, that's such a historic type of feel in the NBA. Like guys are going to get up for that regardless. Mm. Definitely. Um, do y'all have anything else on the in season tournament before we we pivot to the NFL? All Lakers good. is winning it. That's all I got to say, man. Talk, Talk to him, Dan. <laughs> That's about it. Uh, with that, we are going to pivot from, from off the glass a little bit to off the gridiron, preview a little bit of week 13 in the NFL season. A lot of intriguing matchups here, obviously, with not even going to bury the lead, the biggest one of them. I wish they would flex this to Sunday night or Monday night. Sam it's Fran at Philly. They definitely they can like it, they not can. like they can do anything. They can. The Kansas they City and Green. To. The Kansas City and Green Bay one is one that I think is low key going to be a better game than I think people are thinking it's going to be. And maybe I have a little bit biased because I do have Jordan Love starting for me in fantasy this week. So, <laughs> <laughs> but he has been on a little bit of a heater. Um, I, I think that'll be an interesting game. Um, but yeah, they definitely could flex this into a primetime slot. Either way, it is the game of the week. Um, the NFC championship rematch, obviously San Francisco didn't get to have a fair shake at it last season in the playoffs with Brock Purdy going down with the injury. Then you have Josh Johnson going down with the injury. Now all of a sudden CMC is playing emergency quarterback. And really that was all she wrote from there. Um, the, the smack talking has really already started between both of these franchises already. We've got their players going at it on Twitter. Hassan Reddick had a quote talking about, you know, all the 49ers players. He was, he said, they're living in all of this. You know, he said, she said, woulda, coulda, shoulda. He's like, we got to line that shit up. And that's the type of energy that I would like to see (laughs) for a game like this. (laughs) Um, so off the bat, I'm going to reserve my thoughts a little bit. Um, as a Cowboys fan, because hard for me to root for the Eagles in any instance. Um, But putting that bias aside, when I look at this game, I am, I I think this is happening at a perfect time where San Francisco's offense has kind of gotten out of that lull. They're back healthy again. Like they've got all their playmakers back. Trent Williams is back too, which is key for them. And at the same time, I feel like Philly's offense feel like is maybe turning a corner a little bit. It's continue. It's been a little off and inconsistent throughout the season. And obviously that has to happen when you lose your coordinator, losing both coordinators, but again, your offensive coordinator, your play caller, it's going to take some time for that to kind of get cohesive again. Um, I feel like Jalen hurts obviously is playing at an MVP level. Um, And so the collision course for that to happen in week 13, I think could not have come at a better time. Um, obviously has massive, massive implications for playoff seeding um, because while the Eagles do hold their own destiny, they have the, Cow- the the 49ers this week and the Cowboys the following week. So two big back-to-back matchups, um, which, which are going to hold a lot of weight in the, the NFC. So I don't know. I, honestly, I want to hear y'all's thoughts first because in my head, I keep going back and forth about how I feel like this game could go. Um, and no matter how you slice it, I feel like it's going to be – a very, very physical football game. Yeah, 100%. Um, honestly, the more I think about this game, I'm kind of leaning the Niners. Um, I lean the Niners just because I feel like, like you said, they're already getting back on track as far as offensively. They got out of that slump a little bit. And Philly's defense has not been good, like especially on the back end. Like A lot of quarterbacks have had their way with Philly's defense, Philly secondary specifically. Um, and when the Niners' offense is rolling, like you, they can put up points on pretty much anybody. So you add in the defense that's kind of been a little spotty here and there. I think the Niners will be able to put up points. And then obviously the Niners defense is still good. And then like you talked about it, Philly's offense just hasn't looked like a well-oiled machine, like how it kind of looked last year. Um, they kind of get into points where like they're maybe they're down or the game is close. And then Jalen Hurts makes a throw here or there, or like he just makes a play. Like we talked about him being just an elite playmaker. Like he can have a terrible game, a terrible first half. And at the end, and then later in the game, just make one throw, make a couple throws here and there, and just rally them and come back and win. 
Um, but I think if you go down to the Niners, like say you're struggling early, I think the Niners are a team that like if they get a lead, it, it's tough to come back because they're good, just going to be rolling, especially if the offense is moving, putting up points. Don't get me wrong. Philly can definitely come back. Philly can definitely win this game for sure. But um, just the way these two teams are playing right now, I, I think I lean the Niners. And I think Philly's kind of do. Like, they've been winning some close ones. Like, they've won a lot of close games. And now I'm not saying they're getting lucky, but they've got breaks. I, I'll put it that way. They've gotten a lot of breaks. Um, I think I think the Niners win this one. I get where you're coming from. The one thing I'll say that's a little bit disrespectful to Philly is how they're underdogs right now at home. This is that also is them coming off W's against the Chiefs, Miami, the Cowboys, the Bills. And their underdogs going up against the Niners. That, that to me, wild. that's kind that's of nuts. that's kind of a little crazy. I'm going with Philadelphia. I I've seen Jalen Hurts struggle, and then when it's time to be called, he goes and he's playing the best football. I'll go ahead and pull up these stats real quick, talking about when he's leading and when he's losing, because it's kind of insane to see how when his back's against the wall. That's a big question on Jalen Hurts' name. Can he? call up to the task can he be one of those guys that can elevate the way that he has so when they're winning he has a 63 percent completion percentage 1130 yards seven touchdowns nine interceptions 66 passer rating when they're losing 71 percent completion percentage almost 2,000 total yards 1977 total yards that's almost 800 more that's 22 touchdowns that is uh quick maths that is uh, i'm terrible almost almost a full 12 touchdowns more <laughs> uh, well more than that a one interception 114 passer rating he has just been playing at a different level when his back's against the wall and i just look at him right now and i just think this is my mvp and when you're an mvp you have to win these games in this moment especially against san fran who is your biggest competition in the nfc to me i don't see it much as as the Eagles defense is weak where it is. The secondary definitely is a question. I think Brock Purdy will have himself a ball game. I just think that if it's coming down to that last play, very few quarterbacks in the league I trust more than a Jalen Hurts to overcome in that situation. I agree. I think as much as, and really this is a shout out to QB school, JTO Sullivan does great work on his channel, um, but he constantly highlights the anticipation that Brock Purdy plays with um, and just his feel for perfectly reading out Kyle Shanahan's offense. Um, and as much as he's able to do that, like you said, if this is a one score game, if it's a close game and you give Jalen Hurts the ball with a chance to win, my money is on the Eagles. Like I, I just said it on Monday. Like he's shown us since college, he's a play maker and like, I say that confidently as a Cowboys fan. Like I, that's undeniable at this point. He's done it so many different times. Um, obviously, the Bills game being the the most recent one of them. Um, but it, it, I, it's going to be such a good game. I like. I hopeful. Obviously, health stays good throughout the entirety of the game. Um, I think that that Eagles pass rush is also going to have a bit of a, a chip on their shoulder as well. I think they're going to want to get after Brock, make him try to get, you know, unsettled. Um, we haven't really seen Brock have to get into a game like that, like where he's kind of getting, you know, he doesn't get to just sit comfortably and just make those easy reads. Like that's where he lives best. And I like credit to him. That's not a, you know, can't really put that a knock against him. They have a phenomenal offensive line and he makes very accurate and quick reads with the football. But, like, what does that look like when it's sloppy? Because we, when Jalen Hurts has been in multiple sloppy games, he just was in a sloppy one. Like you said, MVP candidates get the jobs done in that scenario. Um, so I, I, because of that, I like your logic. I will lean the Eagles here as well, um, which, again, as a Cowboys fan, ow, Hurts mm -hmm. to want to have to pick <laughs> them. But, um, yeah, he, he's playing at a ridiculous level. Like the his clutch factor is ridiculous and it's funny i think that he has the rushing touchdown off the qb draw that wins the game after all week it's been 
like the comparisons have come up on Twitter between him and Cam and people, you know, cutting the jokes, rightfully so, that like he's gotten so many of the rushing touchdowns off the tush push. He gets himself a nice, you know, 15, 20 yard QB draw. Respectable one. one. Back. Uh, right. Mm-hmm. To, to, to put that game away um, and, and beat Josh Allen and the Bills. So I lean the Eagles here. I think regardless, this is going to be a fantastic ma- matchup um, and very well, regardless of the outcome, could still be the NFC championship game. And I think more likely than not will be the NFC championship game. Like I don't see any other team in the NFC on the echelon of either of these two. Like the next tier starts after them. Pay some yeah. respect to your boys. I think Dallas has definitely been playing some high-level football. And I they think have. that if they go up against the Niners – I get it. I don't I don't trust Dallas in that situation. If they see Philadelphia, that's a great game. And that is a game that I think that is winnable on Dallas's side. I would go I would lean Eagles just because again, they they've just shown a ton of resiliency, but it's not a situation that if you're a Cowboys fan, you can't think that you can come away with a W. You saw it earlier this season when they matched up. They were a play away. They were a play away from making it happen. So I would still give you guys that puncher's chance. It's just the Niners, that's a damn good football team when it when it comes right. to play the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> no, I, I, that, that's the perfect way to put it. Like, you, we get into a game with either of these teams. It's not like it's impossible. It's not like it's a foregone conclusion. But a, as of the last two years, especially with the Niners, we haven't seen it right. Like they've had our number every single time we've played them. Um, and then obviously this last time with the Eagles, both teams being healthy, you have Dak, you have Jalen, you're right in it till the end. But at the end of the day, the score is the score. You come up short in that game too. Um, so like I said earlier, this might've been before we even started recording. Like, I'm glad that the Cowboys have reached this point in their schedule. They've been rolling. They've been beating up on bad teams, which is what good teams should do. Um, but after this Thursday night game with Seattle, like you have Philly, you have Buffalo, got Miami you've got Detroit like you've got some very good comparable matchups teams that are over 500 so we can put that narrative to bed because at the end of the day the Cowboys can't play the games for these other teams that they beat they didn't make the schedule right um and if you want to clown on them for not having a win over a team over 500 when Cardinals lost aside they lost to the Niners and the Eagles two Super Bowl type teams like those are respectable losses. And like you said, especially the Eagles one being such a close game. Um, so yeah, I, I'm again, my, my level of optimism as a Cowboys fan, I keep it very contained. So it's, it's cautiously optimistic. Um, I'm pretty confident against Seattle, but I'm excited to get the Eagles. I think this is a Sunday night game and it's going to be in Dallas. Um, hopefully we can get the split. And then that should provide a lot of confidence to Dak and just the team as a whole that it's like, you're over that hump. Like you can put yourself in that conversation. Um, And hopefully that may change what I just said about that collision course in the NFC championship game being a a Philly San Fran thing. Maybe we can throw Dallas in there. Um, We got to see it. We got to see it. Yeah. I I think y'all can win. Y'all can win. It's just a matter of going out and actually doing it. Like you said, it's not just a, Oh damn, we got Philly. It's over. We're just gonna lose. I I think I can definitely win. I think I like your chances to win. Well, it depends on how the the Philly San Fran game goes like this weekend. But I mean, I like your chances to win at home versus Philly next week as well. Um, but it's just a matter of like I said, you're already playing good ball. Like you're beating up on a team that you should beat up on, which is good. That's all you can really ask for from a good team. You get one of these good wins um coming up on your schedule. Uh, I like your chances. All right. And it's sneaky storyline. Look, the 49ers beat the Eagles this weekend. You go to Dallas, the Eagles win that game. Eve, same record. Like, yeah, it looked like true. it could have been a runaway um, for the one seed in the NFC and wrapped up the NFC East. Like, you end up somehow right back into the driver's seat there. Um, so, it, it, a lot, a lot of weight on this, this Niners-Eagles game um, this week in week 13. Um, another team that we have to talk about. Your Denver Broncos on a absolute <laughs> heater looking to go oh, now from one and five to seven and five if they can get it done this weekend That's against what James Houston. Are made of. <laughs> that is actually an <laughs> unbelievable turnaround. I could not, I, it sounds fake, 
Like, if you would have time traveled from now to, like, after the 70-point debacle and told me that this is how the Broncos season was going to go, I was like, yeah, okay, and Madden maybe. Like, there's no way. (laughs) Somehow, some way, here we are. Uh, So what's what's been the change? Because I know they made some moves on the defensive side of the ball, right? They they got rid of some guys. Frank Clark was Frank Clark being one of the the main ones there. Um, The defense has played to what I think it was expected to as of late. They've really been strapping up, clamping people up lately. Hell yeah! Um, And Russ, Russ is looking. He's cooking. Russ, let him cook. Let him cook. What's so, really been what's really been the highlight of this turnaround has been our defense. You go from 32nd in the league, and if you look before this week against the Cleveland Browns, statistically we were still the worst defense in the league. But when you start to fil- filter it a little bit from week eight on, we're the number two defense in the National Football League, only number two to the Miami Dolphins, another team that's been having a turnaround on the defensive side of the ball. And you look, you mentioned the subtractions. We got rid of Frank Clark. We got rid of Randy Gregory. And we benched Damari Mathis. Jaquan McMillan has been one of the premier secondary players in not just Denver, but in the National Football League. And this is he's doing this as someone who was undrafted. He has been such a spark to this team. He's been awesome. Fabian Moreau filling in in Mathis's spot as well. He's been doing a great job. Baron Browning returning from injury, being a presence on the edge for us that we desperately needed. Nick Bonito coming in and being a presence also. Our defensive line has been very, very strong so far, especially in Barron's return. And we're turning the ball over. We're for- forcing turnovers, I should say, because Russ is not turning the ball over. Number two in touchdown to interception ratio, only two to Mr. C.J. Stroud, ironically, over there on the other side. I think we can mm-hmm. win this ball game. I feel confident in that because of how high our, high a level our defense has played. But I'd be ignorant to ignore how efficient and dominant this Houston Texans offense has been. What C.J. Stroud's doing is something I never expected to see a rookie do at, at, at this level because we've seen some rookies have some high-level seasons. But what C.J.'s doing is historic. He'll most likely break the record for yards in a season by a rookie quarterback. And he's doing it with a rookie wide receiver in Tank Dell, who's been awesome in his own right. Of course, you 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 can't resp- you can't disrespect Nico Collins, who's been one of the breakout players of the league. Just in general, he's been having that type of season. I gotta respect what's going on over there in Houston, but I think our defense can can do a good enough job to limit that Houston Texans offense. And then the Texans defense has not been that good as of late. Honestly, we have been very efficient in the red zone. Russ has been the best red zone quarterback in the national football league. I think that we can just do enough to escape this one. And this one means a lot because right there in that contention for that seven spot is the Texans right above my Denver Broncos. We're sitting at the same record. And if we win this one, we'll have the tiebreaker over them come end of the season. So definitely need this one. But I believe that our guys can do enough to come away with the W. Yeah, this is this is a big it's a big one. <laughs> it's a really big one. But I, I think it's going to be a really good game. I'm excited to see, like you said, Denver's defense has been really good as of late. I'm excited to see what CJ Stroud looks like against you guys. Because, like you said, second best defense as of what you said, week eight. Week um, eight, yeah. Yeah, insane. Insane turnaround after the start of the season. It's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> I know you're probably you're probably giving up a little bit. You gotta be honest with me. Like after you started out one and five, how how are you feeling? Bro? You know how many videos there are of me saying it's time to tank for Caleb? Do you know how many <laughs> videos there are? An embarrassing amount. But I will happily live with that. Now that my Broncos are six and five with the potential to make the playoffs. No way. You're right. That time machine, even with the time machine, I still would have said we're not making the playoffs, but I'm happy to be wrong. All right. I got you. But yeah, I think I think it's going to be a really good. One. I'm I'm really just excited to see Stroud against um against a good defense. So I believe Definitely. in him. I think Stroud is legit. I don't think it's no like but fluky run. I think he's a legit no quarterback. He's an, a legit elite quarterback already mm-hmm. being a rookie. So I but I do want to see him against a really good defense. Yeah, we've talked about it before. His anticipation is anticipation and his decision making is that of someone not even just a veteran like an elite veteran quarterback um so I, i'm excited to see that matchup as well and i wanted to really ask you too. 
It's po- right. like, bro, there's there's points in in these close games where he gets the ball, and I'm like, oh yeah, he's gonna drive them down. He's gonna get a field goal. Yeah. He's gonna win the yeah, game. That's it's like, bro, what, when do you think about that from a rookie quarterback? Like, you don't. There's veterans who I'm like, they got the ball last. Oh yeah, they lost. Like, that's crazy to come from a rookie and to have. I already have that much confidence in him. Is insane. I want to ask you too because uh, I've struggled to find a good answer for this. Um, and it started as like a fantasy football related thing. And it's grown into me like really diving in. Like I, I need to find answers. What is the deal with Jerry Judy? I wish I had the answer for you, man. I wish I had the <laughs> answer for you. I think <clears throat> I, I honestly don't know because he's supposed to be an, a high level route runner. That's really what was supposed to be his his elite trait, and it really hasn't translated so far because our offensive line as of late has been incredible. I mean, every single member of the offensive line, talking Garrett Bowles, Ben Powers, Lloyd Cushenberry, Quinn Miners, uh, Mike McGlinchey, they've all recently have been playing amazing football. So it's not like he doesn't have time to allow the players to develop and him get up. He's just not getting open. Not on a consistent basis. Corlin Sun has been by far and away our best, our best receiver. Not even a close second, honestly. Mm-hmm. So for it to be the case, it really is something that almost doesn't have an answer. Where he's simply just not creating that separation that he was supposed to. Doesn't have that elite speed at the wide receiver position to be a burner down the field. Because you know Russ loves that deep ball. He's looking for the deep ball. It's just not there on that enough a consistent basis. I think I I want to see that out of Marvin Mims a little bit more, allow him to be that deep threat, and then allow Judy to win on the underneath, similar to a Cortland Sun too. But again, I, I wish I had a better answer for you other than it's just Russ and him just haven't had that same connection that they had late last season. Yeah, I, I struggle to, to figure why as well. Um, for the same reason, like he – coming out of college, like he projects to be like an elite receiver talent. I was, I was, I was banging Mm. the drum. Like Corlin Sutton was like last year. I'm like, man, he's, he's really the wide receiver too in Denver. Like this is the time Jerry Judy's about to become the alpha of that offense. And it just, it never came to fruition. Like you said, this year, it's, there's no conversation. Like Sutton is dominating. Um, that receiver room and like shout out to him you have to give him credit for it but like talent wise it's just like I, I it's hard for me to wrap my head around how it doesn't feel like it's translating but look like you said the, the film is a film he's not getting open um, and with a quarterback like you said that is looking to throw the deep ball like you saw the type of production that Russ had with the deep ball in his career in Seattle with guys like a Tyler Lockett or even um Doug Baldwin or Golden Tate, like guys that he could really like let it go down the field to. Um, it's just not there. Um, I do like Marvin Mims though. I think he's like he has the opportunity. I wish I feel like got juice. he could be using he could be used more. Like I feel like there's right. like, you're leaving meat on the bone there with him. Um a fact. yeah, that, but honestly, it, in that case, like that's almost a positive. Like there's even more room for this offense to grow on top of this five game win streak looking to go to six game win streak um broncos man like they're sitting in such a good spot too where it's like you still have to play the chargers twice their season is in the can so it's like who Mm -hmm. knows what those games are going to be like you've got new england it's like you've got a couple of games that you could almost pencil in as wins like things are looking good in denver what do you think (laughs) are we making the playoffs I, it's hey, it's looking try. real likely. It's you looking it. real like like genuinely like I could see them beat uh, the Chargers twice. Detroit's gonna be tough. New England is that's a win. That's a and then Vegas last Vegas last week of the season like I like Denver. The unfortunate right. like truth Denver is that the Raiders have beat us eight games in a row. That's the reason why I look at that game and I'm just like, ah, fuck. I don't know. I want to say we'll win. I want to say that that's a W because the Raiders really aren't like that. But Jesus, if history hasn't shown us that they got a number. But it feels like this is the year that streaks end for me. The Lakers finally beat the Clippers. That streak ended. 
more importantly, the Broncos beat the Chiefs to end right. that insane drought. That <laughs> I was in high school the last time that we beat the Kansas that City Chiefs. Crazy. So, so I, you know, maybe this is the year that finally streaks are broken. Week 18, we go out there, we clinch our playoff spot with that win over the Raiders. That would be super, super sweet. But that Lions game, it doesn't look as impossible as it did a couple weeks ago. Detroit's That's defense nice. has been one of the worst in the league recently. Their secondary has been getting gashed. The run defense really hasn't been as good as it was early in the season either. The offense, especially with our defense, I like our chances against anyone right now. Golf's been shaky. Golf has been like he has especially shaky. Right. Going from a guy we were coming in talking about, he could almost break the completion record without an interception. Like he's a lot more turnovers. We were talking about it like that first Thanksgiving game. Like I was wrapping up cooking and I had the game on in the background. It felt like every second it was like fumble, fumble, interception. Yeah, like yeah. I'm looking over my shoulder, like, that bro, pressure. what is going on to Detroit? That, um, that pressure kind of rattled them a little bit. You actually get after him because they got a great old line. So, like, when golf is like, doesn't have any worries, he's not getting pressured, like, he's great. It's like, once you rattle him a little bit, like, that's when you see the turnovers, you've seen the mistakes, you've seen, like, you know, the bad decisions. So, if you can get after him, I mean, I, I like your chances. Back. To me, that will always be the mark of like a separator between like a great quarterback and an elite quarterback. Like, what do you do when your situation isn't perfect? And that's not even right. saying from like a team construction perspective, but like you could have the greatest O line in the world. And it's just like sometimes it's the other teams' day. Like, guys are just getting after, they're dialing up great blitzes, whatever. Like, what do you do in those instances? And obviously, golf is not a guy that you look at that's someone that can extend plays, but like the greats have a way to overcome that kind of adversity. Um, and it's tough because like that does feel like the world that golf will always live in. Like he'll always be a above average quarterback, but he'll always be looking out on the outside in on that, you know, top tier, that elite tier. Um, because like I said, or what you just said, when stuff is not going perfectly for him when there's a little bit of extra adversity, when there's some pressure, he kind of crumbles and, and the cracks start to show. Um, and you can really apply that across the board to, you know, any NFL quarterback. Back. Yeah. hundred um, percent. Another game I want to talk about, like I said, Sunday night football, that Kansas city chief green Bay game. Um, Jordan love has roller coaster of a season. Um, started out looking good. That middle stretch was looking extremely rough. Yeah. Um, and he's he's put a couple of good games together. And then, like I said, on Thanksgiving Day, uh, to go 22 for 32, 268 yards, three touchdowns, no interceptions, um, and set the tone early. Like the big boy bang eight post to Christian Watson to start the game, like in Detroit. Like that's the type of stuff that sends a message in a division game. Um, and like that just you know really continued to flow throughout the game. Um, like I said. As good as Kansas City's defense has been all year, which has really been the story of their season, you know, because of their offensive struggles, like their defense has really kept them in. And I would argue won them a lot of the games that they've been able to, to squeak out here throughout the season. Um, some, hey, the hot hand sometimes just, just win those battles. Um, and with how this Packers offense has looked, um, obviously they potentially may be getting Aaron Jones back here, which would be a huge addition for them. Um, but he's also been spreading the ball around to a lot of guys, you know, Christian Watson now coming on, um, which is good because he's had a slow start to the year. Jaden Reed's been a breakout rookie, Romeo Dobbs, um, Dontavian Wicks as well. And then even now Tucker Kraft, Malik Keith had a couple of big grabs. Like, there's a lot of options on that Packers offense. Um, I'm, I don't know that the Packers are going to win this game. I think that if there was a team to be on upset alert this week, I would pick the Chiefs because it does feel like one that if their offense does not come and perform, sneakily Jordan Love could put on a good performance, have a couple of good drives, um, and the Packers could mess around and win this football game on Sunday night. That sounds like music to my ears. I don't know about you, Dane, but I would love to see the Kansas City Chiefs get upset by the Green Bay Packers. I got a, I got a member on the podcast, Mr. Joel Moran, 
he is a huge Jordan Love guy, and even he was he just is. like, I, 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 I think that there's a chance. I think that the the Green Bay Packers could do it. Of course, you 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 lean Kansas City ultimately, but you're you're 100 right, man. He's been playing some really solid football over these last few weeks and even in performances where the numbers may not back him he's got a, t- a team full of young guys that haven't been able to hold on to the ball consistently romeo dobbs has a good amount of touchdowns this season but even he he's been struggling with some drops christian watson he hasn't come on until this game versus the detroit Lions, where he finally had his breakout performance it really has been a cycle of guys at the receiver position because they're so young that they're just kind of Throwing darts and waiting to see who's going to stick. Jaden Reed, he looks to be one of those guys that that Jordan Love has a good trust in and a, and a solid uh, connection with. Dontavian Wicks, his ability to get open, although in limited opportunity, he's shown that he can be a guy that you can rely on. And you know the the big playability of a Christian Watson. He's just been a little bit inconsistent, but hopefully last week was a, a sign of good things to come in the future. That Packers defense is full of talent, no doubt about it. Going up against a Chiefs team that right now offensively, they've been struggling a little bit, had a bounce back performance against the Raiders. But again, I don't know how much I buy into the Raiders being the team that you go and you turn around your team or turn around Mm -hmm. your offense with. And and I'm, I'm on board again. They've shown me too many games so far this season that the offense has been so up and down that I know it's Mahomes. I know that you end of the day have to trust that him, Andy Reid, Travis Kelsey can get a job done, but I'll give him credit. Rasheed Rice has been coming on and and recently has been at least coming off this game versus the Raiders where he had his first game over 100 yards, did get into the end zone, saw eight, eight, he brought in eight catches. That's something that can be exciting where it's not just on Kelsey. Now you have someone on the outside that you can trust. And I know he's a rookie and we haven't really seen Andy Reid show that he can provide a, a productive rookie wide receiver. The only one that has been historically solid with Andy Reid, Deshaun Jackson, who's celebrating mm-hmm. retirement right now. So if that's the case, I don't know if you we can be all in back on him. But again, there's some positives to be taken from last week. I'm going to take the Chiefs to win in this one, but it's me just not thinking too hard. The Chiefs defense has been the bright spot of the, the season for Kansas City, Green Bay, Jordan Love has been playing solid, but still first season starting, going up against this elite Kansas City defense. I just don't know if I can feel confident saying Green Bay can come away with the victory here. Excuse me. I lean Kansas City, but would love, love to see Jordan Love come away with this one. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I, I agree with a lot of stuff you guys are saying, especially with the Jordan Love stuff. I think it was tough how a lot of people were kind of seemed like they were kind of out on him when he was going through that bad stretch in the middle of the season, which is, I mean, the guy you got to remember, I know he's been in the league technically for what, three, four years, but this is his first season starting, like actually being the starting quarterback. And I don't care how many practice reps you get. It's not the same as in the game, starting, going up against NFL for defenses. Sure. It is not the same. Um, but I do like the young offense that they have over there. I love the receivers. I like Dobbs. I like Jordan Re- or Jaden Reed. I do like mm-hmm. Watson coming on a little bit. And then Love just looks more poised. He looks more like in control, doesn't look as rattled. Um, just looks a little bit more, you know, has more experience to him. So you love to see that. But kind of like what you guys were saying with the defense, I, I just – he – Jordan Love I'm – a, I'm a Jordan Love fan, but he would very much impress me if he had, came out and had a really good game against his Chiefs defense. A defense that's been stopping some of the some of the really good offenses in the in the NFL. Um, like had a good game against the Dolphins, had the Eagles struggling a little bit offensively. So it's like if Jordan if Jordan Love came out here and really, I don't think he's gonna light the the defense on fire. But if he came out and had a really good game, I'd be a little bit surprised and I'd be I'd be very impressed. Um, at the end of the day, I will pick the Chiefs as well because I do feel like they found something a little bit in Rice. Um, granted, I believe they had Kadarius Tony was out that game. McCall Hardman yep. was out that game, so it was kind of by like he had to, you know, get some more more snaps and things like that. But I think you know you can build off that. His first hundred yard game, um, his first time really getting like hyper targeted a little bit. I think he had what like ten targets, something like that. Yep. So it's still something you could build off of. And at the end of the day, it, it is the Chiefs. So I'm not gonna go against the grain. I'm gonna pick the Chiefs in this one. Yeah, I look. I- I don't mean all that to say that I'm going to go outright and just pick Green Bay because, like I, you said, Andrew, like, you got to lean with Mahomes, with Kelsey, with the Chiefs. Like, this isn't a game that they should lose, 
or but how do I phrase it? It's not a game that they should lose, but it's one that I wouldn't be stunned if they did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the last team that I really want to touch on before we we get into the last little bit here of the pod um, is the Carolina Panthers um, because <laughs> obviously they fire Frank Reich um, after they now fall to one and ten on the season and to me run one of the most egregious play calls of the season up to this point. Um, for one of the very few times this year, you're in a game where Bryce Young has the ball with a chance to go and tie the game. And with all the chips on the line, it's fourth and six. There is absolutely no way you can call a tunnel screen. Like that is the most pathetic play call. Like that's the type of stuff that really irks me as like a football player. Like if I was a lineman in that huddle, and that's what I, I hear come in, I'm frustrated. Because it's like you're you're basically throwing in the towel when it's like we already don't have these opportunities frequently to be in this position in games. We just so happen to be playing uh, – it was the Giants, right? They just they lost to – Titans, sorry. Titans. Mm -hmm. um, but it's like you don't frequently have these opportunities to be against a team where we can at least be competitive, and this is one of those very few games. Um, and so to run that really feels like a slap in the face – um, and I can't pin that on anybody else. Obviously, Frank Reich was the play caller up at this point. Um, but that individual play is like the smallest portion of what is an absolute dumpster fire in Carolina right now. And you cannot pin all of that on any one person in particularly. You definitely cannot pin that on Frank Reich and use him as a scapegoat, which is what it feels like David Tepper is doing in this situation um, and, and relieving him. And what's even tougher is like what head coach would want to come in? Like this vacancy is so unappealing. You don't have your draft picks. Um, I, I'm not going to get into the, whether you like Bryce Young or not. I think it's way too early to give a fair read on him, um, especially with the situation that he's in. He had it's fair to say he has the worst O-line in the NFL. Like some of the tape that they've put out this year is like egregious. Like this, like we would get clowned in high school for stuff like this. This is supposed to be an NFL offensive line. Um, and on top of that, I think they also have the worst receiver room in the NFL. So you've given him no protection and no one to throw to. And I guess there's nothing that you can grade off of because of that. Um, and so to go out and fire, fire Frank Reich, and then what really like put the cherry on top of this entire week and situation for Carolina um, is David Tepper's comments um, where he kind of alluded to the fact that Bryce Young wasn't the initial guy um, that they were looking to draft, which is a crazy, crazy, crazy thing to say when your team is sitting at one in 10, you just fired your head coach, uh, definitely a scapegoating you know, type of job. And your quarterback, you know, has to be in a position where, like, his confidence is going to be fragile. Like, there's only so much of this type of stuff you can take before, like, you, it starts to get shaky, bro. Like, and that's inevitable. That's human nature. Like, if, if you're continually put in these positions and, and failing, like, it's going to be tough for you to overcome those kinds of circumstances. So to almost add fuel to the fire in that way, is so outrageously disrespectful. Um, and just the way that he comes off about how he feels so, you know, wanting to be hands-on as an owner, like, again, being a Cowboys fan, I feel like owners should deal with being an owner, and they have other <laughs> positions in football operations for a reason. They have general managers. They have, you know, VPs of player personnel, all of those things. Those jobs exist for a reason because you're not supposed to do all of them. So as an owner, you should not be trying to dibble and dabble in the football operations. Go be the owner of the Carolina Panthers and let that be. Um, so I want to turn that to y'all, get y'all's thoughts on this Carolina situation and obviously them firing Frank and then, you know, Tepper's comments as well. Go ahead, Dan. I, I think that it's, it's just owners in this aspect kind of piss me off when it comes to the impatience because, all right, you come into the season, right? You got a rookie quarterback. Number one overall pick, still doesn't matter. Rookie quarterback. Like I said, no line, no receivers. What, like, you're firing your head coach because you guys are, what, 1-10? Because you guys are all, 
offense doesn't look good. What do you expect coming into the season? Like, would it have been better if you guys were what six and what was that six and five or something like? Or not six, five, like five and six, something like that. Would it be like it's? You guys are still losing. You guys still don't have your own pe- your own picks. It's still a, a rebuild. It's still a process. So it's like firing Frank Wright to me just doesn't make sense because I don't know what the expectation coming into the season was supposed to, was supposed to be. Obviously, you know, you don't go into a season like, oh, yeah, we're going to lose. Like, we know we're going to lose. But still, you got to be somewhat realistic. Like, firing him after 11 games, this team was never going to be good. So, like, that's the part that gets me to where, like, the, the impatience from for some owners doesn't make sense, especially in certain situations where you're not in a position to win games. Like, you guys were never going to be good. I get it. It's been bad. It's been, like, absolutely terrible. But still, the fire him after 11 games, like I said, definitely scapegoated. Um, I don't know what you expected. I don't know what coach would have came in here and had these guys winning a whole bunch of games. Like the talent is just not there. So from that aspect, I just feel like he was being way too impatient. Yeah, I understand. It's just the issue of you have a rookie court, a rookie quarterback. Your job as a head coach is to at least put him in a, a slight position to succeed. Now I'm with you. The upper management didn't do a good enough job to put pieces around Bryce to be successful offensive lines terrible you mentioned it probably the worst receiving room in the National Football League to a point where we're seeing Adam Thielen put up you know solid fantasy numbers but as a football player you understand that he's not fast he's not he's not really separating that well it's just due to circumstance that they have to put the ball in his hands because what is their other option at this point in time you got DJ Chark Jonathan Mingo. I mean, these aren't really high level guys. And and DJ Chark to this point, who's been a I don't want to say journeyman, but this is what his fourth, fifth NFL team at this point in yep. time. You know what DJ Chark mm-hmm. is. And Miles Sanders, you brought him in. That was your big move of the season. That's where you lose me. A running back, a running back was supposed to be the move that was going to help Bryce Young be successful in his rookie season. I can't, I can't see that. But you mentioned the play call. Uh, it, I feel like that's yeah, that's why Frank Reich is is the problem. I understand where you guys are coming from. There's bigger fish to fry outside of just Frank Reich because of the issues that we just listed out. But as a head coach, you got to do something to protect your 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 future or I guess your your potential franchise quarterback in a Bryce Young because right now you're allowing conversations to be had that Bryce Young was the mistake, that that he's the reason, or, you know, even putting that idea into people's minds that that's the reason why they're not winning any ball games. when in reality he was never going to be put in a situation where he was never going to have the even opportunity to be put in a ch- or to have a chance to play winning football. So it is also hard when you look at what's going on over there in Houston, another team that was in hell prior to this season. And now we're talking about them as a potential playoff team. One in the same year that they drafted a rookie quarterback also, but that situation to me, not to everyone, but to me was always better than the one in Carolina because at least there was some reliability in terms of who he was throwing to. Nico Collins, I never anticipated he would be this, but you did have Dalton Schultz. You had a respectable O-line where it wasn't, it's still not great. It's an average O-line, but you look at what's going on over there in, in, in Carolina. It's horrible. Nothing about it is good. So to me, as, as the owner of the team, you got to be smarter with your words where people can, you know, manipulate what you want to say. But I think what he said was fine. He said that he thought that the consensus was Bryce Young would be pick one, that Houston would be in a position where if they were a pick in front of them, that Houston would have taken Bryce too, so that when they went to one, the consensus was Bryce would be their guy. Where you say something even along those lines where Houston had an opportunity where you want you thought that you would be the one to take CJ Stroud, you can't even put yourself in a position to be to be misquoted. So I I I'm with you guys. I think that there's a lot to be said about this Carolina Panthers situation, how terrible have how terrible it's been handled so far this year. And it seems as if we're seeing a reincarnation of what happened over there in Jacksonville where you had a Trevor Lawrence, a generational talent, not that Bryce Young is, but he had a horrendous rookie season. You see how much coaching matters year two when Doug Peterson goes in there. Now we're talking about a playoff team. Do a better job this off season of reevaluating what you can do better and, and finding a head coach that can be 
best to help Bryce Young in his development. Maybe a, a Ben Johnson over there in Detroit comes over here in Carolina and has a young quarterback that can, he can help develop. But if I'm Ben Johnson, like you mentioned, Billy, this isn't my first option. This isn't the team that I want to go to and help fix. There's a team over there in L.A. that has a, a quarterback that – that has yet to have his full potential unlocked. I'm talking about the Chargers and Justin Herbert that I feel he'll have, or at least there'll be a vacancy very, very soon over there in LA that I would it rather go been to vacant. Carolina. It sh- no, Fair. no doubt. He should not be, he should not have a job right now. Uh, but again, it, it's ugly over there in Carolina and I'm hoping better for Bryce Young. Yeah, I definitely don't want to absolve Frank Reich and all of this because on top of Tepper's comments, like, previously like Frank Reich also had alluded to that um, that CJ Shroud was more so where he was trying to lean between him and, and Josh McCown QB coach there now in Carolina um, that like Bryce was not their first option either this is it's all around such a horrible situation to put a guy in um, and look for casual fans like they're gonna take it and they're gonna run with it and there's already so many people that are calling Bryce a bus and all of that is, is so overblown and it shouldn't matter, but it does because that's the type of noise that gets to people. Um, and it only gets amplified when you have internal conflict like this, where it's clear Definitely. that you were not the, the first guy um, for them. So I, look, this is about as bleak of a coaching vacancy that I can remember in years past, like with their current set situation, and not owning their first round pick in the next season. Like this would be a, a very, very, very tough turnaround. So m- my heart goes out to whoever does accept this vacancy. Um, Definitely. Because that is, is not for the faint of heart. Um, and it, it feels even scarier knowing that like, you know, Tepper just pulled the plug on Reich after 11, you know, 11 weeks, like, Leash doesn't feel super long if he's an impatient Not type of owner. Like exactly, you guys don't get that many opportunities to be a head coach in the NFL. Like if you go out and you have a bad first stint, you can go four, five, six, but you might actually never get a second opportunity. You're right, like, that could be Definitely. it for you. So like you could be committing career suicide. Like there is so much that that goes into trying to accept this kind of of an opportunity. So. It's a dumpster fire. It's a mess. Uh, I'm interested to see how they're going to play it out. I'm I'm hopeful that Bryce can stay strong because I do think despite the mess, there are still flashes of, you know, his playmaking, his ability to extend plays, which obviously has to do a ton because there's people in his face 24-7, which, you know, obviously if he had a better receiver room would only be – you know, amplified, but, you know, at times, like he has to scamper around just to complete basic check downs. Like, so if they could get a better O-line in there and some, you know, a decent receiver for him to throw to Adam Thielen being your ex in the year 2023 is an insane mm-hmm. statement. Like that is crazy. crazy. They're like, going to throw so much money at T Higgins. It's not going to be funny. I like, oh, I've facts. already penciled in T Higgins is a Carolina Panther. It, it's uh, that's great. I think it'll be a, like, a great fit in terms of just like good. At least there is somebody for Bryce Definitely. to throw to um, a guy that can get separation, a guy that you can just you give him a chance, bro. I'm not yep. throwing Adam Thielen up on anything. <laughs> like, no, first of all, no. he's not going to get there. What is there to throw no. up? <laughs> You're spitting. Um, all right. So I'm, I, I'm hopeful that they can figure that out because – I, I never want a guy's career to go like this. When you see, like, looking back on other organizations, the Browns are one of the biggest culprits of this. Like, you go in, you absolutely tank a guy's confidence to start to his career, and it just can never rebound from that. Um, like, these formative years are so important in, in any player's development, but especially a quarterback, um, because it's not only their own play, but it's also, like, other coaches' perspective of them. Like, Part of that goes into why this whole Geno Smith resurgence with Seattle is as big as it is. Like, Definitely. joked around that he didn't write back. But, yeah, like, uh, most coaches in the league wrote you off as a starter quarterback, bro, because yeah. we saw what you <laughs> did um, with, with your time in New York. Um, so it, there's a lot of weight that goes into these first couple seasons. So hopeful that they can turn around, but 
It's going to be a monumental, monumental long task ride. To do it. Long ride. Good luck. Definitely. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> That's really all, all you can say. Um, with that, I want to get into the, the last little stretch here. I'm um, going to go play two quick games. First one is going to be um, a Would You Rather with some sports scenarios. We did this a couple of weeks ago. Um, fans really seem to like it. They did really well um, on TikTok and Instagram. So we're going to, we're going to bring it back. We're going to play it Let's here with it. you, Drew. Um, got, was this four different scenarios here? Um, basketball or football related. Um, so the first one I have for y'all is, would you rather play full NBA game and go scoreless or play full game and have 50 points dropped on you? Whoa. Scoreless or 50 points? I'm going scoreless. Yeah, I'd, rather I'd, rather go, I'd rather go scoreless. Yeah. I'm not trying right, to get embarrassed. Now. <laughs> yeah, he's going to be out there doing the cardio? As long as I'm playing de- – like, listen, you're saying I'm scoring zero, but that didn't say that I'm not locking up. Like, I could be a P.J. Tucker. Yeah. That's facts. That's fair, yeah. That's All right. Fine. I'm going to take that could, route. You can impact the game other ways, bro. 50, you, you're hindering the team, bro. You're a liability out there. <laughs> But it's funny you bring up P.J. Tucker because that was also his reality against KD in that right? playoff game. There's nothing you could do. It just sometimes the better offense wins. That's it. And you're, you're telling me I'm letting my opponent drop 50 on me. I'm the reason we lost. I didn't. If I didn't it's score, true. if I didn't score a bucket, I could still help my team win in other ways. I, that's a fact, Dan. Facts. Yeah, okay. Okay. Next one I got here. Um, would you rather be an elite playmaker or an elite defender? With the caveat that you would basically be below average at every other aspect um, of basketball. So, would you rather have elite playmaking or be an elite defender? Elite mm. defense can get me into the Hall of Fame a, a, without being anything else, without having to do anything else. Where, so I'm saying, if you're saying I'm an elite defender, that means I'm a good rebounder. I obviously can guard the perimeter. I'm I'm a great interior presence. I'm getting blocks. Mm-hmm. I'm getting steals. Like I could stat, I could stuff the stat sheet in that regard too. Dennis Rodman is like the key, key piece to that. Where or Ben Wallace, another one too. So with playmaking, I don't want to be a liability on defense. Uh, playmaking, I guess you could say you technically with with how much I've been learning about basketball over these years. Playmaking is not just passing. It's also your ability to create for others while the ball's in your hand, and you're also getting your own bucket too. But I feel like the safer the safer route for this, so people don't get confused with what playmaking is. I'll go. I'll go elite defender because again, I can be a lot with just being an elite defender. Facts. Uh, it's the same way for me. It, like, I could be on the court and be an elite defender. There's always gonna find elite, even if it's situational. There's always gonna be minutes for me. If you're an elite playmaker, True. like, but I suck on defense and I can't shoot, like, that's kind of tough, bro. It's kind of tough to find your minutes sometimes. I'll go defense. I'm not going to lie. This could have been, would you rather be an elite defender or be great at everything else in basketball and be a bad defender? And I would have picked elite defender. Like, Fact. to, could you imagine what it would really be like to know that you could step on an NBA court and, like, you could lock up another superstar, like, put them in hell for 48 minutes? The type of shit I would talk. (laughs) (laughs) That's a fact. That is a fact. Yeah, I I would take elite defense as well. Um, To be fair, though, the type of shit I'd talk if I was an elite scorer and nobody could guard me would be next level. If if I know there's no one on the planet that can guard me, I'm never shutting up. My ego's through the roof. Nah, being Kevin Durant must be a different type of feeling, knowing that I'm 6'11", 7 feet. I can do whatever I want with the basketball. There's nothing you can do. Sorry. All right. Yeah. You can't walking, stop. Walking my player. Um, next one I got here, little NFL one. Would you rather block prime Aaron Donald or have to tackle prime Derrick Henry? Jesus, this is this is the worst. This is Rock by far harvest. the worst. So die or die. That's that's the question. Or basically. Essentially. You know what? I would rather block Aaron Donald for this reason. He's running through me. He's not going to hurt. He Maybe he could hurt me. No, but he definitely could. <laughs> with, Derek, 
with with Derek, he's straight up running through me. I'm most definitely getting hurt by Derek Henry. Where Aaron Donald, he kind of like tossed me out the way. Like he really can't do too much in that regard. Where you see Derek Henry, he's hitting with a stiff arm or he's lowering his shoulder and running right through you. That's my logic. That's the only way that I can get through this question. I'm gonna say I'd rather <laughs> block Aaron Donald. But again, you're right. It's do I want shit or shit? Unfortunately, I'm gonna have to take one shit over the other. Yeah, I uh. I, I actually I was gonna say Derrick Henry, but you just convinced me. I like your logic because <laughs> there you Aaron go. Donald he's gonna throw me out of the way. Like he's I'm not the goal here. Like he's trying to get to the quarterback, so it's like he's gonna take one in and shove me out of the way. Derrick Henry is going to like no. I'm trying to score. You're in my way. You're gonna eat dirt. So I, I I'll try to block. I'm try to block Aaron Donald. It's not gonna work, but I'll try. The old lineman in me is coming out, and because <laughs> of that. I'm going to say I actually would rather tackle Derrick Henry oh, because goodness. to think about Aaron Donald in a four point stance and like fire off bull rush through my chest. Like, I don't know if I like my rib cage might never recover, bro. Like <laughs> genuinely, at least with Derrick Henry, like, I'm going for them ankles or something, bro. Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, there's a, uh, I'm definitely not taking it up head on. Like, there's no way nah. I'm about to like collision meet you in the A gap. Oklahoma like, drills. That, that 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 sounds career ending. So I, no, for sure. I, I'm definitely I'm taking the dive. I might eat dirt. I might catch a stiff arm mid air. Yeah, it'll be embarrassing. He might helicopter me. I don't know. Whatever it is, <laughs> I'll take I'll, I'll take all of that over thinking about Aaron Donald. Like, legitimately, like a bull rush. Nah, that's painful. Like I, the that's way that shit. NFL D tackles come off the ball, like it's like getting hit by like a small pickup truck. I'll just I just pray that, like you said, Aaron Donald just like realizes, like, bro, I'm no match, bro. Just shut right, just a little side. like speed just, move or something. Yeah, that's just all you my need. hands away. Yeah, that's that's all you need. <laughs> if you if, if you bull rush, you're an asshole because you didn't even need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> you did not need to do that, bro. You didn't need to bull rush me. You could have got me at any move, but you decided to bull rush me. No, you did that on purpose. <laughs> But wouldn't, wouldn't that feel like something? If you were an NFL player and it's like you see this little guy, wouldn't you do it just out of like ego I would bull, check him real quick? I would bull rush with like one hand. I wouldn't full on like pile drop. Just like Aaron Donald could probably use his pinky and like like shove me to the ground, bro. Like you, you don't even have to do too much. But the crazy thing is, yo, know. Billy, you're right. There are some NFL players that see a mismatch. Like even when they treat the rookies, uh, the first one that comes to mind was – um. Uh oh my god, uh, Crosby, Max Crosby in, in, mm. in training camp yeah. when Michael Mayer is going, he's like, he goes to his guys, yo, watch this, watch this. And he puts Michael Mayer to the dirt, just violates him. Yeah, that's kind of <laughs> what I feel. Billy might be up to something. Aaron might see us and be like, nah, this is food. I'm about to show him <laughs> right. what this is really about and violate us. But you're right, he would be an asshole for that. He doesn't have to do all that. <laughs> right, bro. I'm not worth all that, bro. You don't need to do that. Definitely not. All the plethora of pass rush moves he knows, he could hit you with any type of swim, rip, club, spin, half spin. He could hit me with a crossover. I just, I just I'm not staying in front of him. <laughs> like, even in my best playing days, like, that's a joke that I used to like run around with, like, uh, when they were going to the Super Bowl. I'm like, bro, I just want to know what it would be like to block Aaron Donald. Like, one time, like, no joke. Like, I don't want him to take it lightly. Like I want to experience what it really would be like to have to block him. And like, now that I'm washed, absolutely not. <laughs> like, I, don't even want to, I don't even want to think about it. Like it sounds terrifying. Honesty, man. Yeah, no, no. Last one I got kind of in the, the same train of thought. Would you rather catch a pass over the middle against Ray Lewis Oh, or go up for a layup against the bad boy Pistons. Yeah, go up for a layup on the bad boy Pistons. Ray Lewis would kill me. I, I hey. at least could walk out of the arena. I could walk out of the arena against the bad boy Pistons. I would get hurt. I would get hurt for sure. They definitely caught some bodies. But Ray Lewis could do some permanent damage to me. <laughs> Over the middle of the field, I might be. There's a chance I might be able to walk again. Ray Lewis was that <laughs> yeah. bad of a man. No, I would definitely rather go up on a layup for the, against the Pistons, even though that's not no easy competition either. 
Listen. No, you're definitely like your your fa- one of your cheeks, your face cheeks, your ass cheeks is kissing the hardwood after you go. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, Bro, the other option could have been you getting jumped in the street. I'm taking that over going over the middle <laughs> with Ray Lewis, bro. Like that, bro. Watching that back in the day, those hits of receivers took it's insane, bro. You 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 remember the clip of like Ocho Cinco trying to block Ray Lewis yeah, like on the crackback? And he just got like destroyed. And Ray Lewis wasn't even looking, he was just just shoved yeah. him out the way. Him seeing me run a slant over the middle, I would die. Legitimately, I'd yes. die. I don't think I'll ever yes. walk again in my life. I, I yeah, no, I'm not picking that. I'm sorry. When I was typing the question up, the play that comes to my mind, and I feel bad because I do not know the Jets receiver's name, but I know y'all know the clip where they go over the middle and Patrick Willis hits the guy and like his yes, body bro. goes limp. Like I was thinking when I typed it, I was like okay, you know, bad boy Pistons is tough because at least if you get hit by Ray Lewis, you got pads on, but then it's like, it's not no, the same, bro. No, pads <laughs> like, aren't doing not. anything when that man's running full speed at you. Nah, yeah. bro, I'm not doing it. Yeah, I, I, I would have to take the layup as well. I'll leave the arena on crutches, whatever yeah, it is, roll facts. my ankle, bruise my hip. Like you said, Ray Lewis, that is permanent lifetime damage. Say, you you the might not be the same coming person. onto the field. They're rolling yeah, me out of the stretcher. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we're not even exaggerating. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, no pun intended, but like Ray Lewis might catch a body. Like, for real, for yeah. real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is uh, that's wild. Uh, that's going to do it for the, the Would You Rathers. Um, the last thing we have before we wrap up tonight um, is going to be a head-to-head draft five-man starting lineup with only NBA Defensive Player of the Year winners. Um, so I have the list pulled up. I did get a little scared because they only did it. I think Defensive Player of the Year has only been handed out since like the mid-80s, and a lot of guys uh-huh. have won it a lot, but there are enough players for everybody to have five-man lineups. Um, just it's going to be some big boy lineups. You're going to have some centers <laughs> playing the three. <laughs> not um, many guards at all. Definitely right. not. Um, but – Drew, since you're the guest, we're going to give you the first pick. Uh, Again, any player that has won Defensive Player of the Year is eligible. All right. Well, I'm going to take the cheat cheat code option. I'm going to take Michael Jordan, pick one. Uh, (laughs) Fair play. I get Defensive Player of the Year. On top of it, I get arguably the best offensive player of all time. Seems like a no-brainer. That was a lot. Let's go. Yeah. Let's do do snake orders, but then Dame, you go, and then I'll get back-to-back. To go to the second round. Okay. Um, looking at it, honestly, give me give me Kawhi Leonard. I'll take Kawhi Leonard. Low key but I get I guess I get elite pick. offense too. I still get elite defense. Give me Kawhi Leonard. Okay. Then we these guard plays slim. Um, I might not even have a guard. Kawhi might play my one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jordan's gonna playing take... my one, no doubt. <laughs> I'm going to take, strictly for the offense here, I'm going to take Hakeem. Good pick. Yeah, um, that's a good pick. That's a really good pick. So I'm going to have him at my, I don't know yet, actually. My I thought about taking four. Hakeem one. I'm not even going to lie. I thought about taking him one, but Jordan, I mean, people would be upset at me. <laughs> it's a fair play, bro. Like in turn, I'm like looking at this list offensively. Him, Jordan, Kawhi. All have cases to be one, two, three. Jordan one in that order in terms yep. of offense, but um, like one of the few elite scores on the list. I'm gonna pair that and get an. And now that I think about it, hold on, because if I take a guard and all y'all's lineups is a bunch of seven footers, that might be dumb. <laughs> uh-huh. so I'm gonna hold out actually, and I'm going to pair Hakeem with. Give me, give me Draymond Green. Give me Draymond okay, Green. Ooh, bring that's some, good. some yeah. level okay, of versatility that's a good right there. there. Okay, that's uh, at least a guy that can can handle the ball. It still gives the defense, you know. Hey, maybe forty percent from three shooting he might bring that too. Who knows? Maybe hey, Prime Draymond, Prime Draymond can shoot. Prime, Prime Draymond has shoot. himself some shooting badges in 2K. He, he, he did. Different. He was solid. So I, Six I got threes Kawhi in game now. seven of the NBA Finals too. They don't talk about that. That's facts. They do not. Ah, this this is tough, bro. This is tough. I already got Kawhi. 
I'm gonna actually I'm a, I'm gonna go Kevin Garnett. I think that's what I'm gonna do. Good here. pick. That's I'm a good go pick. Garnett. That's a good pick. I tell yeah, you what, I'm not. I was going to say, you literally went with the guy on this list that probably talks the least amount of trash and immediately paired him with the guy that talks the most amount of trash. <laughs> <laughs> you need someone to do that dirty work. You need that's someone right. that's, that's going to do need. that. All right. I'm going to take – you You mentioned the guard, and I felt like I, I, I wanted to pull the trigger on it, Gary Payton, but I don't know if I am because I got Jordan. I don't know if I need it. I'm going to go Giannis. I'm going to take Giannis Ooh. as my next pick. Giannis pick. and MJ. Now, the next one is between mm, – it's either Dennis Rodman or Gary Payton. Mm. I feel like if I get Gary Payton, I just can build an actual perfect starting five. But getting Dennis Rodman, now we're talking about me having one of the best defensive lineups in the game. The versatility I feel like I would can- be crazy. It would be. I feel like I gotta. I gotta go, Dennis Rodman. I, I'm gonna go, Dennis. Okay. That's a tough lineup. That's a whole, damn. Okay. This is tough. Getting, I getting Michael's a cheat code. Like y'all did me the favor. I got <laughs> MJ. It's not fair. Hey, and he got he he got the real life chemistry boost. You got MJ and, and Rodman back together. True. Didn't think about that. <laughs> That's a fact. That's a fact. Mm, do I go guard here? I got. I got. I think Kawhi. I literally. I think I just scared myself out of taking a guard. <laughs> I, bro, these lines are gonna be huge, bro. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Dwight. I'm gonna go Dwight Howard. Good pick. Good pick. I'm gonna go Dwight Howard. KG and Dwight. Wow. I like all how all my guys, you know, obviously elite defenders, but they give me offense too. They give me elite offense. They can give you buckets. Prime Dwight was giving you like twenty four. Facts, mm-hmm. facts. Now I got back to back picks. I got Hakeem. I got Draymond. Um, there's a couple of interesting names still left on the board. Definitely some interesting names on the board still. I'm gonna go with. Give me. Oh, no, I can't because I always talk about how fraud his defensive play of the year is. I can't do that. Um, okay. It definitely was Marcus Hall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about it, but, like, that is the most fraudulent defensive player. Should of the year. be at LeBron's that's, that's, yes. that's <laughs> Uh So I, I'm not going to do that. This feels like a wild pick, but, like, spacing-wise, it does kind of make sense. Give me Triple J. Give me Jaron Jackson Jr. Mm, okay. okay. So now he could he could play like a little hybrid three role. Um, we got so you know what? you're doing the right thing. The thing that I never do, I go for best, just best team because I'm a big <laughs> fantasy guy. I just go for the best players. But you're doing is the smart thing. How can they fit on a team? I I respect that. You keep that in mind. I I don't, and I should. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. It's getting it's getting hard with the, the remaining options here. Um another what's his career three point percentage actually now? I'm looking at it. Oof. Yeah, a couple years above 40. Man, give me give me metal world peace. And okay. the the metal world piece on my team that's that's Ron Artest. That sucks. <laughs> I hate that. I really was hoping metal world piece was gonna drop to me. That's a great pick. That is a really good pick. So I I got Dwight. I got KG. I got Kawhi already. I got options. You know I got options. I don't got no one that could play my one right now though. I'm be honest. I might bite the bullet and take the guard. I, I I'll do it. I'll take Gary Payton. Fuck. Oh yeah! Fuck. <laughs> nah, that is free food anywhere on the court. We're posting that man up. <laughs> Listen, bro, he not. I know he's sure he's not sweet though. He won Defensive Player of the Year for a reason. He did win Defensive Player of the it's Year true. for a reason. Yo, did you guys know Dikembe won Defensive Player of the Year four times? Did he? Really? That's yeah. kind of crazy. Rudy, he Rudy's won. about to cement himself in the rare air. Ooh, the- David Robinson. David Robinson did win Defensive Player of the Year. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna go the Admiral. I'm gonna lock okay. that one. 
Now, this is where I think I, I, I feel like I'm forced to play Robin at the three. That's hideous. Um, is, is Marcus Smart going to have to play my one? <laughs> oh, Lord, it's a, there's another guard on this list. It, he's, it is. he's old, but he's there. Super. Sid, who's, you have Sidney to go Moncrief? way back. Yeah. Or Mike Moncrief. Cooper. <laughs> Michael, Michael Cooper. Yeah. He, he, you at least getting somebody that can handle a little bit. Well, I don't know how much handling he was doing you in know the what? early 80s. But. I needed that, bro. Sidney Moncrief, my last pick of the draft. Okay. 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 I like it. I like it. Let me see here. So I got. Let me see. I got. I got Gary Payton. I got Kawhi. I got KG. I got Dwight. I could kind of. I could kind of. I can go wherever here. I think. Probably mm-hmm. somebody to play my three. Uh, you know what? We're just gonna be somewhat of a big lineup to make up for Gary Payton. Give me a uh, Ben Wallace. I oh, I was about to pick Ben Wallace, bro. Oh my, my god, my spacing is atrocious. Like, I, it's just bad. <laughs> <laughs> we can't shoot, but it, who cares? We're gonna lock up. Ah, oh, dang. Hakeem, Draymond, Triple J, Metal World Peace. Who is gonna complete my roster? Who the hell is handling the ball? Draymond. That is our one. Fair enough. Draymond Green. No, fair he enough. Is. Fair enough. You got it. <laughs> um, so this is my last pick. It's crazy that Rudy Gobert is still on the board because he really might end up with four DP DPOYs at this point. I'm he good. might. He wasn't getting drafted I'm by good. me. I'll say that much. <laughs> 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 he was not getting drafted by me. Um I'm about to pick this guy solely off vibes. Give me Joe Kim <laughs> Noah. Okay, I like it. I actually really do like that. I do. I don't like know how he fit. He definitely he don't fit. But <laughs> vibe vibes are up. Grit is up. Intensity is there. We got we got we got some brewing I, now. I, I want everybody to. Squad. I want everybody to go through their teams, but like. List out who's playing your one, your two, your three. Like you got to get it in order before you wrap this up. All right, I'm gonna try my hardest to make this make sense. All right, at my one, I'm gonna have Moncrief play off ball. I'm gonna have Jordan play my one, even though he's the greatest two of all time. I'm gonna have Moncrief at the two, at the three. I guess I have Rodman at the four. I'm gonna go Giannis, and at the five, I got the Admiral David Robinson. For oh, as many utility. for as many bigs was in the the pool, this is a like respectable like one through five lineup. It is. Right. I tried my like, hardest. No one's really out of position, crazy. Except for your Draymond running the one. That's about it. <laughs> well, I'm talking about his team. My team no, is all time. I'm about to have. Oh, okay. Joe Kim Noah's about to be my shooting guard or something. I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna figure this one out. <laughs> I bet my team. I got Gary Payton running my one. Um, I got Kawhi at the two. I got Ben Wallace at the three. I got KG at the four, and I got Dwight at the five. I see the vision. Ben Wallace a little bit on the the shorter side for bigs. He's, yeah, exactly. You know what I mean. He'll he'll be my stopper. Okay. And for my team, I do have Draymond Green at the one. I'm going to put Metal World Peace at the two. I'm going to put Jaron at the three. Yep. Yep. Joe Kim at the four. Okay. And then the big man himself, Hakeem, will be playing the center position. Well okay. done. Well done. You maneuvered the hell out of that lineup. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how. Hey, we we've got like decent, like okay spacing for the 90s. Like we have two shooters. That's a lot. <laughs> Make it work. Definitely. At, at least somebody has to respect the the corner three or the wing three when Hakeem is about to hit somebody with the dream shape. That, that's all I can ask for. If, if all these teams played each other, the scores are going to end like 74 to like 76. <laughs> and that's being generous. <laughs> no, it would actually be crazy. Who do you think? Of all the people drafted, like who is the worst offensive player? Because I think I have, I think that there's a clear answer. I'm not gonna lie, and it's no disrespect to them, but it's just it is what it worst is. Worst offensive I mean, you argue, player? You could probably argue Dennis Rodman. I'm trying to think of everyone that got drafted. Hold on. 
Or on our teams, or just talk about in general who won the award? In general. Okay. Now, on our teams, or even oh, won on the our award. teams. Yeah. Won okay. the award, okay. I think it, it's probably the same. I think I, I drafted the worst offensive player. Who are you? Like Joe, 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 Joe Kim's career average is like eight points. Uh, he actually, his career from free, like from free throw line is not terrible, even though he had a janky looking free throw shot. It was his shot was horrible. Seventy percent though, that is crazy. That's, what, I that's don't think I would. I don't think I would have guessed it was that high. I don't know. I'm going to say Rodman's my worst stats. offensive player. Moncrief averaged twenty one points in a season, 22, 23 points in a season. He doesn't have a three point shot at all. But they weren't shooting the three pointer back then. Listen, call me call me a casual, but who the hell is Alvin Robertson? I don't know who that is. He averaged <laughs> nine points for a career. What position did he play? He sounds Alvin remember. Robertson sounds like he sounds like he probably was a nasty small forward back in the day. Yeah. Bro, I don't he was a guard allegedly. Oh, he was six four. Yeah. He averaged nine points. He was uh, apparently he was clamps though. Okay. Yeah. That was a little before my time. I don't know. I don't know who that is. But yeah, Joakim Noah is definitely up there, though. As far as like worst offensive player, he's definitely up there. I guess Draymond yeah. being a facilitator kind of gets him out of this conversation. A little bit. That's a nice. little bit. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie. My last pick, if it wasn't Joe Kim, I probably low key would have took Tyson Chandler. I bro, Tyson Chandler, and that almost goes That's back a to pick me too. That mm -hmm. goes back to me being a Dirk fan, like bro. That Tyson Chandler, and that was like a little – he was a little bit past his prime Tyson Chandler, but he was still getting the job done. Let's not Lord talk about out. it, please. <laughs> the way that little 11-year-old Billy was vibing after that championship, like one of the greatest runs in sports, I will die on that hill. It's true. It's true. As much as it, it's a knock on my GOAT's resume – I would be a fool to say it's not one of the better runs that we've seen and one of the more Cinderella story runs with the Dallas Mavericks for sure. Yeah. No BS. Like during those early stages of COVID where it was like, nobody was really like, you really weren't going anywhere. And Bleacher Report started putting out like highlights of old games on YouTube and stuff. I probably watched the like full, they did like a full series recap of just the 2011 finals. Probably like 40 minutes. Definitely watch that like a solid like four or five times. <laughs> I have not watched since. The only time I will watch again is when the LeBron documentary drops. I cannot get <laughs> myself to watch it again. <laughs> You're not trying to see that nice little dirt, little Don't body up that. spin finger roll? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> uh, well, that my get back going... was when he put, I'm sorry, my get back was when he put Jason Terry to the ground. When he was on the heat, that that was my get back, but uh, no, that's a that's a bad L. That's a bad L. <laughs> no, one of these days, Dame, I definitely want to do like either ranking or just reacting to like all of the most disrespectful posters like in NBA history. Oh yeah, you know I'm with it because yeah, that Jason Terry one. I've, how is that not at absolute worst top three? Like, bro, he made a man a grown man horizontal in midair. And the lob before, <laughs> like toying with them, that's what makes it worse. Like double they were lob just was crazy, insane. Like, bro, that's just embarrassing, bro. I'm sorry, it, that it made it way worse. Yeah, LeBron, is, he's way too disrespectful. Because now thinking about that, y'all remember when he, he jumped? jumped over, he jumped over yeah, John Lucas, yeah. cleared him. That's disrespect. Like. That's God, an assault let an, on let another man. man jump over me in in the heat of competition. We might have to fight. <laughs> Can't go out like that. All right. No. No. I'm putting <laughs> the hands up. We're squaring up. Yeah. The balls over your head. That's too much, bro. No. 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 <laughs> no. The level of disrespect you have to go to to even attempt that is too Nuts. far, bro. You'd have to see me, and I'll lose the fight because LeBron is six eight six nine. LeBron. Nine, hey. <laughs> I'm, I'm going though. down swinging. Yeah, it's pride. Definitely pride. Um, but with that, that is going to do it for episode 48 of the Off the Glass podcast. Drew, we appreciate you a ton. This was a blast. Of course. Bro. Yes, sir. Um, definitely, definitely. If you are not already um, subscribed to Pick a Side, please go check them out. 
definitely go follow, subscribe. Check out the Fantasy Reaction Show, too. I know that's coming out. You all drop an episode tomorrow, right? Yeah, tomorrow night. Facts. Yeah, Thursday night. Go tune into that as well. Um, if you made it this far, watching or listening, we appreciate you a ton. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe to the channel. If you're on YouTube, then go over to the audio platform, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Go ahead and pre-download the show. Drop us a five-star rating and then follow the socials that you see there on the bottom of the screen at Off The Glass Pod on Instagram and at Off The Glass Podcast on TikTok. As always, I'm Billy. That's Dane. We got Drew as well. I'm out. Peace. Yes, sir.